Five Live Sports, sit back for the next two hours. We'll be hearing the voices of summer. Good morning, Henry. My dear old thing, a very good day, Agus, and thank you for that. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to you. Welcome to Old Trafford on what I'm glad to say at the moment is a fine day. Welcome to everybody at the start of this summer. Hope we've all had a good winter. We've got through it anyhow, which is something. Bowling, bowling remarkably enough on this warm morning in a sweater. Moves lightly up, well up on his toes. In, bowls to Botham. Botham drives his four runs. A marvellous stroke, that. What a marvellous stroke. He's played no better shot than that in the whole of the series. There's one chap in a white and blue shirt holding up a bottle of beer, drinking Botham's health. Laker comes in again, hair flopping. Bowles turns it on to Maddox oh. Fields. He's out LBW, and Lakers take no day. Jeff Boycott has got his 100th hundred, and the crowd cannot resist coming on to the pitch any longer. He tried to step over the stumps and just didn't quite get his leg over. Anyhow, he, he did very well indeed. And he clips this one away, and that is it. He goes down to square leg. He's made 200, and I'm afraid there's an invasion of the pitch, and Paul Richards is being mobbed. And a freaker. Oh, a freaker. We've got a freaker down the wicket now, not very shapely, and it's masculine, and I would think it's seen the last of its cricket for the day. <laughs> and we had Lewis playing extremely well. Agus, do stop it. Uh, <laughs> Australia are all out for 348 on a golden evening at the Oval. He's bowled non-stop. Since T, am I right in thinking? No, he hasn't. I think he'll have given himself a telling off on the way back. He did very well indeed. Batted for 35 minutes, hit a fall over the wee keepers. Beggars, <laughs> for goodness sake, stop it. Well, that montage will be on the Five Live website later. You heard there from John Arlott, Brian Johnston, Christopher Martin Jenkins, Henry Blofeld and Richie Benno. Tonight we celebrate the names and voices that have resonated with cricket followers through the ages. We'll hear plenty from the BBC's rich archive and we'd love to hear your contributions as well about your favourite commentators and commentaries. We've had so much input already via the Test Match Special Facebook page and the BBC Sport website. You can text us on 850 850- Five eight. You can tweet us at BBC Five Live and use the hashtag Voices of Summer. And you heard in there, of course, from Agus, from Jonathan Agnew, the BBC's cricket correspondent for the past 22 years. He's in the studio with me. And the former England and Somerset offspinner Vic Marks, who's been a Test Match special summariser for how long now, Victor? Well, it depends if you count a freakish uh, appearance <laughs> in about 1984 when everyone else was ill. Too long, I think. <laughs> <laughs> But 20-odd years will do it. 20-odd <laughs> years. Agus, we're going to talk... We will talk about TV cricket commentary later because we're going to talk about the peerless Richie Benno. But I think if you stop most people in the street and said to them cricket commentary, most of them would immediately think of radio, wouldn't they? It's, it's woven itself into our culture since 1957 with Test Match Special. I think it has, thanks to those voices that you heard in that lovely opening. Um, people can relate to a voice, I think. And, and when you have to rely on that voice for the picture that you're conjuring up in your mind. Therefore, I suppose that voice is actually even more powerful. You know, if, if, if you're seeing something on a screen, the voice is an accompaniment. When you're listening to that voice for information, I think it inevitably stamps an, Im- an impression on you, and that, that's, that's the difference between the two. So I said, Victor, we'll hear from the voices I mentioned already. We'll also hear from Truman, Bailey, Mosey, Laker, Cozier, McGilvery, Tufnell, Boycott, Frindle. We'll go round the world as well. But there's a rich tapestry of voices there from all parts of the UK too, which actually wasn't always the way that the BBC was half a century ago. And in, in many ways, Test Match Special was ahead of its time. You know, the BBC was all received pronunciation and all that 50 years ago. Well, I'm not sure Fred Truman stroke, spoke with the uh, BBC English, no, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. No, the it, cricket yeah. was ahead of itself. It's, yeah, yes, perhaps it was. Perhaps it was. I mean, that montage. I think we may as well go home now. Actually, that yeah. montage was brilliant, and it was so <laughs> evocative. All those voices, we're all familiar with them, but I'm sure thousands and thousands are. And it'll take some beating that montage. <laughs> but also, the point should be made that, that, that Vic and I grew up with this. You know, yeah, like, we, we, it, it, it yes, made the impression players, on us as kids. As players, then, oh, no, as kids. Yeah, yeah well, that, that was what was we so amazing same. about being in the same box as Brian Johnson, yes. is that I listened to him when I was in shorts mm. and little T-shirt mm. and was about ten. Yeah. And then somehow, freakishly, however many years later, 
I find myself in the same. You must have felt it even more. Absolutely right. the same. But we both, I think we both felt, I remember that test match at Headingley when we worked with him when I first got this job. And I think we both admitted to each other we were actually... We were nervous. Bit, we were very nervous mm. bec because suddenly we were, well, you know, we're walking into this amazing room with these voices who had played such a huge part of our childhood. I mean, for, for me, it was on the farm with my dad, who would wander around with the radio, yeah. getting the harvest in. So, so for me, it's, it's cricket, it's harvest, it's, it's, it's all of those things woven in together. What did it mean to you as a player, Test Match Special? Well... I think if you're really honest, I'm really honest, not a hell of a lot. <laughs> because we were playing most of the time when we were into, in our 20s. We would catch snippets when we were driving here, there and ever. We all knew John Arlott and Brian Johnson. Um, we come across Brian Johnson, sorry, John Arlott, in a different role, actually. He was the president of the Cricketers Association and a very conscientious one. He loved cricketers. So we'd bump into John Arlott yes. occasionally. I wouldn't have come across Brian Johnson. So you you picked up snippets. Mm. Actually, my favourite, I don't know whether we've got any of him tonight, was Alan Gibson. Do you remember Alan yeah, Gibson? Yeah, well, well, Alan Gibson's daughter has texted us to say, please mention my dad. Well, quite yeah. right, too, because he was a brilliant commentator yeah. and a brilliant writer, but he didn't last very long for various reasons. <laughs> but... Um, he was a voice I remember, Brian Johnson, John Arlott. Mm. I, uh, but I might have been on the farm, my own farm, not Jazz's, <laughs> <laughs> listening as well. Yeah. But there is that black hole as a player, definitely, yeah. from, from when we actually started playing ourselves to when we started doing this full-time, and maybe that helped, actually, in a way, to, you know, although we were a little bit anxious at the start, but not to be absolutely consumed by nerves. We'll hear from Henry Blofeld in a second, but we're going to begin with Christopher Martin Jenkins, who so sadly passed away on New Year's Day at the age of 67. He commentated on Test Match Special for 40 years. A listener, Charles Efford, posted this on the TMS Facebook page. He wrote, I sorely miss Christopher Martin Jenkins, who was a true master of cricket and the English language. To describe his speaking voice as impeccable would be an understatement. To hear him describe a test match, an incomparably English experience. We shall never see his like again. In comes Amanath again. Oh, it could be LBW. Out. It's out. Oh, Lord. LBW, he pulled across the line holding, and India have caused one of the greatest upsets in the history of all sport. They have won the third Prudential World Cup, beating the hot favourites, the four to one on favourites, the West Indies. Devil turns, goes in again, boycott, 96 not out, he bowls to him, it's a half volley, drives it down the ground and there it is, he's done it, he lifts both hands in the air, Jeff Boycott has got his 100th hundred and the crowd cannot resist coming on to the pitch any longer. Well, he's 98, not out now, and Fraser Bell's too many. Drives it through mid off, and this is Sachin Tendulkar's first Test 100, driven up towards the mid off boundary. Lewis in pursuit. They'll get three runs for it. And this 17 year old has become the second youngest Test Centurion in cricket history. A heroic performance. Really the stuff of which schoolboy novels were made. In comes Lee. Bell's to Peterson, who hooks it hard. Oh, that's a great shot. That's the best of his sixes, because that went to a distant, old-fashioned oval boundary. Down towards the block of flats, opposite the Harleford Road, just to the left of the pub, at mid-wicket, right out of the meat of the bat. Swan in again for the Vauxhall end, and that bites, he's caught it short leg! And it's Swan who's taken the final wicket! Hussey, the hero of Australia, who's out. It was Cook who took the final catch. It's all over. England have regained the ashes after losing them so humiliatingly. 5-0 in Australia only two years ago. Australia are all out for 348 on a golden evening at the Oval. So amongst that from CMJ, the 1983 World Cup final, boycotts 100th 100 at Headingley, Sachin Tendulkar's first test century in 1990 as a teenager. There's going to be clearly something missing. There's something missing already in your commentary box this summer after the first two tests against New Zealand, mm. Agnes. No, it's hard listening to that. Yeah, <laughs> it's still pretty raw. Um, and with headphones on and, you know, we'll be hearing that voice again. Uh, and Christopher was a very good friend of all of ours, great friend of the game. Uh, and he was a brilliant commentator. Uh, you, you hear the detail in his commentary, more so, I think, than anybody uh, that I've worked with. Um, 
strangely, like again, that golden evening at the Oval. I've talked yeah. about that before. You know, you know, it's a little throwaway line, but the yeah. sun is shining. You can sort of it's all picture everything. Yeah. That description of Peterson six wasn't just you know he smashed it for six. Uh, yeah. It was down to that part of the boundary yeah. near that block of flats just by the pub. I mean, all yeah. these things. And if you're listening, as we said earlier, you know, it just you, you find yourself imagining all of that, and that's the difference. Um, between someone who is absolutely brilliant, like Christopher, and someone who does a reasonable job. And that's... The, the, the precision of it all there. Yeah, and what struck me listening to that, there's a big difference, as you'll know, between what Agus does, the commentator, and what I, I've been doing, which is summarising. And as a commentator, you'll tell me if I'm wrong, you always do, <laughs> but as a commentator, you know, and we heard a lot of clips there, you know when a moment's coming. And I would have thought... There's time to get a bit nervous. There's, Lara's going to score 400. Jeff Boycott's going to get his 100th, 100th in a test match in Leeds. And you've got enough time to start to panic a bit. And we heard all those seminal mm. moments, great occasions. And, well, he certainly didn't panic. He was right. I mean, we all, you, I think, said somewhere that dear old CMJ, where he was at most control of his life was in front of a microphone. I mean, yes. those moments are brilliantly, it's brilliant. It's, 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 but there was time to get nervous about it, but he didn't seem to be. No. I think you get excited, actually, about it, those big moments. Uh, but, but you could also, you can also, if you are thinking ahead, prepare and make a few notes, but I don't think Christopher had done that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we should did. mention that the BBC and MCC, and he was president of the MCC 2010 to 2011, have announced the creation of two sp- Spirit of Cricket Awards in memory of Christopher. They'll be called the Christopher Martin Jenkins Spirit of Cricket Awards and will include an elite award and a youth award with both intended to support the grassroots game in England and Wales. I was very struck by what you said on that sad New Year's Day morning where you said, you know, probably the best friend that cricket ever had. So yeah, it's, it's, so it's we're, we're talking about commentary here, but actually in a wider yeah, context it's of the game. what Christopher really stood in. I think it's what the programme actually believes in too, is the spirit of cricket, you know... Brian Johnson and co. Very much the feeling that that the game is paramount and you want to protect all the good parts of the game, not pompously or or, or in an old-fashioned sort of a way, but because actually that's the way that the game will be best played. And sometimes as a player you can get your your blinkers on and you're there in the bubble in the dressing room and and you actually forget sometimes what what they're there for and what what the the, the bigger picture is. And Christopher particularly, of course, you know, he, he still felt that batsmen should walk. Uh, and got very cross when they didn't. Um, no one does now, so he got cross quite a lot. But you know, th- th- I think it's a perfect way for Christopher to be remembered, actually, with that with that particular award. Here's CMJ in rather mischievous mood. I don't know. I should read out this email from Anne Marie Briggs, but I'm going to. It was great to listen to the lunchtime item item about past commentators, and it brought back a lot of memories. I can't understand, though, how most of those who are still commentating only sounded a bit younger on the old recordings, whereas CMJ not only sounded a lot older, but also sounded like the love child of Terry Thomas and a Dalek. (laughs) She wants me to say exterminate during the course of my commentary. Here comes... Bravo, trying to exterminate Collingwood, who plays him back up the pitch. <laughs> exterminate! Will that do, you, do it for you? That's, that's the last time I do it, I assure you. <laughs> um, Victor, the stories about CMJ away from the microphone are legendary, and we heard them, you know, we're lucky enough to go to St Paul's and, and hear your address, Aggers, but, you know, stories of him trying to make phone calls on the hotel remote control and so forth. They're rather legendary when he was on tour, as you say. He was at his most controlled in front of the microphone. Absolutely. I mean, there was a certain amount of chaos <laughs> beyond the microphone. But they're mostly true. I think they're all true, in fact. Um, and I remember him delightfully telling me years ago, he used to drive up to the Oval Test match uh, from Horsham. Uh, and he he recognised that he had a bit of a problem being punctual. That was mainly because he couldn't bear to waste any time at all. And he was explaining to me, it's just a sort of picture you have in your mind, of how recognising, looking at the watch, I'm a bit late, better get going, and he'd lodge this bowl of cornflakes with the milk, probably a spoon, between his legs as he revved up his car and set up (laughs) the M23. And, I mean, it's just the way he was. But he uh, he was also magnificent on tour. There's, as you know, there's a lot of people follow England on tour and they would swarm at CMJ. Somehow the rest of us sort of crept off. 
And you almost saw him at his best there because he would sit there chatting to them for hours and hours. Most of us fled like fury to the nearest dark <laughs> corner of some bar. But see him, Gene? He was hours, a great fan, he? wasn't he? And that's, yeah, it's sort of yeah. confirming about this loving cricket. He loved yes. cricket people as yes. well. And it, he couldn't bring himself to be gruff with them and say, sorry, go. Yeah. No, not at all. Uh, he was always late. I mean, the amount of times we'd say, after a word from Victor, Le Cristo Martin, yeah. oh, he's not here. <laughs> uh, and, and he wouldn't be there. Then the, you know, he, he, you'd hear the footsteps rushing up behind the commentary box, and then he would come. And it was never quite his fault. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, and there's one more before we, we move on, the time that he did go to the Oval instead of the Lords, or vice versa. Uh, vice versa, yeah. yes. <laughs> he, he, we were, I think we'd just gone on air at the Oval. Uh, we wondered where CMJ was, <laughs> because this it's, it's was a new departure, and he phoned in and said, I, 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 this match, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, actually, I'm at Lords. <laughs> uh, we're, we're, we're at the Oval, uh, Christopher. I thought it wasn't as bad, perhaps, as going to Southampton rather than Chester <laughs> Street. Uh, but it wasn't. I mean, it, it was again typical mm. of typical of Christopher. David says cricket commentary on the radio has painted vivid and inspirational images down the years. However, it's the humility as well as the ability of these commentators that marks them out as outstanding. Our Brooker got in touch via the sport website. TMS is like reading Wilfred Owen or one of Shakespeare's England soliloquies. In a moment, more about. CMJ because just before I came on air I spoke to a man who was very much one of his contemporaries, the one, the only, Henry Blofeld. Here's Willis in, bowls to Bright. Bright bowls! The middle stamps out of the ground, England have won, they've won by 18 runs, Willis runs around punching the air, the boys invade the ground and the players run helter-skelter for the pavilion. Well, what a finish. Bright bowled Willis for 19. It's a hat-trick ball now. Broad is on a hat-trick. Kumar has come in. We've got four slips and two gullies and a forward short leg. And here's Broad. Just listen to the noise. He's up to the wiggy deep. Bowls to Mike. It's for him. It's bowled him. He's taken the hat-trick. It's fantastic. Broad has hit his off stump. Kumar is out. Three wickets in three balls. 273 for eight. And isn't it absolutely fantastic? It was an humdinger of a ball. It was a beauty. Henry, welcome to the programme. Lovely to see you. Two commentaries there. England beating the Australians famously at Headingley, of course, in 1981. And then Stuart Broad's hat-trick against India in 2010. 29 years apart. The voice drops a little, doesn't it, over oh, the Oh, it years? does. I, I'm <laughs> sure if I heard a recording of what I was like when I first did it, I, I, I should be appalled. I'd be embarrassed, I think, probably. <laughs> I don't think anybody likes listening to themselves on the radio or the television, from my experience. Andy Hardingham got in touch saying he wanted to hear Blower's description of Bob Willis knocking out Ray Bright's middle stump at Headingley in 1981. That was such... That was the, a, an amazing end to an extraordinary test match. It was an amazing game of cricket. I mean, it has to be the most exciting one I've ever seen, the most remarkable one. Although, in a funny way, England's victory in Mumbai in the second test this last November was in as, as surprising a victory as that one against Australia for many different reasons. But um, it was extraordinary. I remembered when I did that commentary, someone rang me up uh, from from the BBC uh, later on that evening saying I, they thought I'd caused probably 23 car crashes around the kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> as people, of course, listening as they go about their business, what has been your approach over the years to the art of cricket commentary? I think the most important thing of all is to be yourself. Um, if you start trying to be someone else, I don't think it works and I think it, it sounds rather hollow. It has a, a bad ring to it, I think. My other approach, I mean, I like to describe lots of things. I always remember when I did my first trials at a county match and two 20-minute tapes and came and listened to them with Henry Riddle, who was a large man, who was then the assistant head of outside broadcast bracket sound bracket. And he said at the end of listening to two tapes, which I hated doing and I have loathe still listening to myself, he said, we like it because we think you begin to paint the picture. And I said, what exactly do you mean by that? And he, in his room, he had a picture on the wall of some horses in a field. And he said, most people will look straight at the horses, but if it wasn't for the grass under their feet, the cloud up, up above and the trees at the side, and then the mount and then the frame, it wouldn't be a composite picture. And you must always try and remember that when talking to an audience uh, who you're their eyes as well as their ears, so to speak. You've got to position yourself and you've got to try and build the framework of the ground around you. Interesting what he said there. You started then with the BBC in 1972, about the same time as CMJ. Were you immediately struck and thought, we've got very 
contrasting styles here, and maybe that's no bad thing. You know, styles complement each other, don't they, in so many phases of Oh, life. I think they do. I mean, CMJ was marvellous. He was so meticulous. He was so p- precise. I said it a few minutes ago that you've always got to be yourself, and I'm not going against that, what I'm going to say now. But if every young commentator wanted a lesson as to what he, it should really, what he should, the effect he should get across, he must listen to CMJ. Because CMJ was absolute copybook. He was precise the detail was there. He wasn't perhaps the character, the flamboyant character, Arlott or Johnston, but he was every bit as important. Did you have a rivalry with CMJ? A no. nice rivalry? No, I don't think we had any sort of rivalry. Um, I read once, when, when he, when he sad, so sadly died, I read in one or two of the papers that people were implying that we had a rivalry. I don't think we did. He was always a staff man, wasn't he? I mean, he was BBC Creek correspondent twice. I was never a staff man. And I was jolly glad to do what, what, what I was asked to do. And it never occurred to me. We were never vying for the same slot, if you see what I mean. So, as we know, Henry has a unique approach to describing cricket commentary. Here are a few examples. The first aeroplane of the season just just disappeared behind the block of bats at the far end of the ground on its uh, way towards Heathrow. And Javid has a wild drive. He wasn't very near it, I don't think, which is just as well for him because there are four avaricious slips there waiting for the edge. And the throw at the stumps by Ahmed, it's gone for four overthrows. So five runs, buzzers indeed, absolutely. Buzzers like mad. Where did buzzers come from? Buzzer, well, we always used to call it buzzers when I played cricket at school. And, I know, and my club captain used to always say, buzzers! I was uh, splendid. And I, now, whenever I've said it before, people sort of look at me and think I, I'm, I'm, I'm a lunatic. Well, that may be so, but um, <laughs> we still call them buzzers. Oh, look, I've just seen a crane, Lords, actually moving, doing some work. I've seen cranes all around this ground for years, and they've always been still, and that big white one there is moving. A moving crane, a yellow helicopter, what more has the day got to offer? It's some um, rain. Bill, you're an eternal pessimist about this rain. I, I know. My it's... wife, who is about 100 miles from here, in the direction where the rain is coming from, has just described it. Well, will you see go out, go outside, heavy. Go outside and blow it away. <laughs> well, come back to your. I think you described it earlier as, as looking at the composite picture in a second. But your relationship with Bill Frindle, you enjoyed a joust with him. Oh yes, Bill. Bill was Bill was fairly tough on me when I first joined TMS, and he didn't let me get away with much. And of course, I had a tendency to make mistakes. And I I think I always have had, probably. And Bill always rather liked to underline them slightly. And so uh, the, the, the great moment was when you discovered that he... I mean, his art form was wondrous, the beauty of his score sheets. But when he got something wrong, I, I one didn't half enjoy rubbing his nose in it. <laughs> I don't think he enjoyed it then quite as much as the other way round. You just mentioned the cranes in that commentary there. You're famous for your pigeons as well. Is that going back to that meeting you had that you described with Henry Riddle, that you're looking at the composite picture all the time? I think it is. I, when I first started, I wasn't uh, anything like so expansive, actually. And I remember Peter Baxter, who was produced for 34 years, saying to me, uh, Blurs, you can, you can leave the cricket occasionally if you, if you want to. So, in fact, he has a bit to answer for. Yeah. And, I mean, you know, you like to dress well, don't you? I mean, your, your, your trousers, we often see in this day of Twitter, of course, that Henry's got mustard trousers or red trousers in today and a, and a bit of a bow tie. It, it's, is it all... Uh, uh, showman's not quite the right word, because that doesn't imply there's a professionalism, which, of course, there is underneath it all. But there is an enjoyment to it all, which is absolutely fundamental in this job, I think, almost more than any other commentary job. I think you're absolutely right. But going back to the coloured trousers and everything like that, I've got to give Agus something to talk about, haven't I? <laughs> <laughs> and how would the... Uh, you obviously, you work with people like Michael Vaughan and Phil Tufnell, out upon whom you were commentating not that long ago. How did the England team react to you, both when they're playing and now when they've stopped playing and they're working with you? I get on frightfully well with them, and funnily enough, when I'm out in the middle at sort of quarter to 11 and starting the programme, and the England players walk past, they all, they all come up. I'm, I'm Matt Pryor, you know, uh, Alistair Cook and Swanee, and they all sort of have a smile and have a laugh. They yeah. know I'm an idiot, you know, and, so, and, and we all get on, I think, fairly well. Uh, and, oh, well, that's and, tremendous, isn't it? Because, you know, everybody wants the game to thrive, whether you happen to be an England player or a journalist or a, or, or a pundit or a watcher or whatever. You know, you're all rowing the boat the same way. Well, we are, but I think we're all rowing it 
it, it in our own particular idiosyncratic ways. I think one of the great virtues of TMS, it's a, a marvellous mix of styles and of voices. If everyone did everything the same, then it would be a switch-off time. And people, one of the questions people ask me is, who do you like working with? I will never answer that question, because just because someone does it differently to the way you do it yourself, you can easily think to yourself, well, it's, it's not so good. That's absolute nonsense, because there are many ways of, of killing a cat, aren't there? Interesting, this question of styles, because, you know, in the world of boxing, they say that styles make fights. You know, you've got people yes. with different styles fighting each other, makes it interesting. Cricket commentary, more than any other commentary, obviously because it's over an entire day, including lunch and tea, you need styles, don't you, just to complement each other. And it also means as the listener, well, I know who's on now for the next 20 minutes, I know, if you like, what I'm going to get. Yes, well, I liken it to uh, to batting, really, commentary, in a way. In, in this particular example, CMJ and Blowers in that half hour, yeah. you've got two people doing exactly the same thing, with exactly the same fundamental technique. Bowler runs in, bowls, and the batsman does whatever he does. But then it goes off in completely different directions. You have in CMJ, Sunil Gavaskar, and you have in Blowers, Verenda Sawag. Yeah, and that's yeah. the difference between between the two characters. And, and you know, hurrah for that, because, you, because he's quite right, you couldn't be the same. I mean, dear old Blowers, Blowers brings an energy to a game. He brings a game to life more than anybody that I've worked with. It's often not the same game the rest of us are watching. <laughs> <laughs> but he brings it to life. Sometimes and not with the same players, no, either. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Which he admitted in that interview as well, yes. to be fair. Well, you're absolutely right, Angus. <laughs> Which is what Henry says when he hasn't been listening yeah. to anything you've been saying for the last five minutes. But, but I will just... To reinforce what you're saying about opposites, another part of it, which Agus does extremely mm. well, is that view from the boundary slot. Yeah. And one of the best view from the boundaries that Henry did, I remember, and you'll remember it, was with Dennis Skinner. Yeah. And yeah. you'd think they would be poles apart, yeah. but they, they were. Poles apart. <laughs> well, they are poles apart, but yeah. they got on famously, and it was yes. a brilliant interview. <laughs> With, you know, unlikely origins. Well, Ed Barnard makes the point. Blowers and toughest together doesn't get any better. Henry makes me laugh out loud and smile every time he has the mic in his hand. The range of different commentators makes TMS so special. John says, back to our CMJ clip about Terry Thomas and the Dalek, that's pure comedy gold. Martin Abling says, people may disagree, but good cricket commentary is, in my view, an art form. Is it an, is art, it an form? art form? I don't know. It's, it's hard to say when you do it yourself, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. I mean, I, I would say, and, and on two things about Henry's bit there, is A, you're absolutely right, you have to be yourself. And Henry told me that on my first day at work. Be yourself. Don't try and copy anybody else. And the second thing is that when people come to me and ask how to do it, I'd, I'd really think that's an impossible question to answer because you know what the basic is you can go away and do it yourself but after that it's down to you uh, and so it's actually a very hard thing to teach whether it's an art form mm. i don't know perhaps, perhaps, perhaps it is in its own way but they all do it differently and you uh, you know being next to them you'll know that Jonas did it in a completely different way to cmj who did it in a different way to aggers yeah. and, and that must be good actually with Jonas, you wouldn't say a word probably until at the end of the over, and no, something wouldn't. extraordinary had happened. Yeah. Whereas with Aggers, at the other end of the scale, really, you're having a constant conversation, and yeah. that's... Yes, that's and, and I think that's where it has changed a bit, actually. Yeah. And not necessarily for the better. I think there no. was that strict discipline, whereas during the over, the commentator commentated, yeah. and he had his time. And now I think, perhaps I have encouraged it a bit too much, it was conversational type of yeah. thing. And, and the, the pauses, the gaps that we'll hear from John Arlott later, for instance, when he's commentating, wouldn't happen today. It wouldn't happen today. Whether it worked today, again, is, is a moot point, perhaps. But that really illustrates the difference in style that I think has evolved. Spike says, I know it's coming. The leg over has me in tears of joy and sadness every time. Joy at hearing John is laughing. Tears, I miss him so much. Tissues at the ready. Spike coming up after nine o'clock. <laughs> coming up after half past eight, the doyen of TV cricket commentary, the one and only Richie Benno. After the news with Faye Ruskin. On digital radio, digital TV, mobile and online. This is BBC Radio 5 Live. Mark Bridges has been told he'll spend the rest of his life behind bars after being found guilty of abducting and murdering five-year-old April Jones. The judge described him as a paedophile and a pathological liar. April's body has never been found. 22-year-old Michael Adebowale has appeared at Westminster Magistrates Court charged with murdering the soldier Lee Rigby in south-east London. The second man, who was also shot by police in Woolwich, is still under armed guard in hospital. 
Police in Shropshire are searching an area of woodland following the disappearance of 17-year-old Georgia Williams. A 22-year-old man's been arrested on suspicion of her murder. The European Commission is taking the government to court over restrictions on benefits for EU nationals. Ministers insist the UK's additional residency checks prevent abuse of the welfare system. And new figures suggest house prices in England and Wales rose slightly last month. They were up by 0.7% on April last year. Sport tonight. Frankie de Torre has been formally cleared to return to racing at the end of his six-month cocaine ban. The three-time champion jockey will be back with two mounts on the first day of the Derby Festival at Epsom tomorrow. Stoke chairman Peter Code says new manager Mark Hughes was the only man he interviewed about replacing Tony Pulis at the Britannia Stadium. Rain has interrupted much of the day's play at the French Open. Rafa Nadal will now play his second round match tomorrow. Earlier world number one Novak Djokovic made it through to the third round. In the women's draw, Sam Stoser is through but Lee Na, the champion two years ago, is out. Roy McIlroy's disappointing forms continued after missing the cut at the PGA at Wentworth. He's carded a first round 78 6 over at the Memorial Championship in Ohio. And over on Five Live Sports Extra, right now there's Major League Baseball, the White Sox taking on the Cubs in an all Chicago matchup. And the Cubs currently lead 2 1 in the third inning. In Toddick in South Yorkshire, the A57 is closed in both directions between Goose Car Lane and Toddick Crossroads. Traffic's queuing there after an accident. In Carnforth in Lancashire, the A601M northbound is closed at the M6 at Junction 35. There's been a serious accident, so expect long queues. And in Eastington in Gloucestershire, the A419 is shut in both directions between Spring Hill and Old Ends Lane. There's been an accident there. Bay Rusco, Five Live Travel. Five Lives, big day out. As well as fighting talk, the six 606 end of season awards and live music from Primal Scream. Let's go back to our caller, Bobby from Glasgow. We can't wait. Liverpool's going to be great. There'll be appearances from Everton legends Peter Reid and Neville Southall, former Liverpool striker John Aldridge and boxer David Price. Plus, comedian Angela Sepathimu will kick the whole event off from 5.30. And just added the stick. Five Lives Big Day Out, Saturday from 6. For more info, click bbc.co.uk slash five live. So we were talking about the third inning in baseball. We're talking about the Voices of Summer, five live sports celebration of the great cricket commentators. Our correspondent Jonathan Agnew and TMS summariser Vic Marks are with us. You can text us on 85058. You can tweet us at BBC Five Live or using hashtag Voices of Summer. We have had a huge reaction. We really have. James says, Blow is the best commentator bar none. My dream lineup is him, Boyks, Aggers, Tuffers, Vaughney, Bumble, Simon Mann for his technical commentary and Benno and Warren for the Aussie View. Ellen in Leeds says, I came to cricket late in life, but now I have my trusty digital radio. I'm in love with blowers, with his inquisitive seagulls, his <laughs> ponderous cranes, not to mention his passion for public transport as well. And I guess lots of tweets today about the batsman's holding the bowler's willy. Oh, well, you won't find that. Because it never happened. It never happened. It never happened. And people have got this in their mind. I don't know why or how, but I can promise you that as much as dear old Jonas would love to have said that, he never did. I mean, I'm sure he probably <laughs> dreamt about saying it once, but it never happened. I'm afraid I have to put that one to rest. No, he probably he probably said it in an afternoon a speech that he wanted to have. Absolutely. Didn't he? And it, it, just it, was, it, would, it was never broadcast. It never broadcast. OK, still to come, we'll talk about John Arlott and Brian Johnson, as well as some of the great summarisers who grace the airwaves. For the next few minutes, though, we'll focus on a colossus of television cricket commentary. What a marvellous stroke. chasing it. From the commentary point of view, I've always held 1981 as uh, the best year. The Headingley Test, that was the test match. Safely away for four. That's a split at 100. You had Botham doing what he did there, having been sacked from the captaincy. 50 in the first innings, a century in the second, and six wickets. A marvellous all-round performance. It was a fairy tale, that 81 series. Bowl him. It's all over, and it is one of the most fantastic victories ever known. I've had a lot of fun, that's the, the big thing, and I've enjoyed every minute of it. It's gone straight into the confectionery stall and out again. And that's it.
The unmistakable tones of Richie Benno, who started commentating for the BBC in 1960, still commentates on Channel 9 in Australia. Straight into the confectionery stall and out again is one of the greatest mm. lines of all time, isn't it, Aggers, in cricket commentary? We're talking about a man not just a great in broadcasting, but in the game of cricket, oh, aren't you? Absolutely. I mean, it, it, Richie is, is a colossus. And again, working alongside him, which I did for a year or two, you just so aware. And not that he would in any way want to put any pressure on you, but just because you were working with Richie Benno. Listen how short his sentences were in those, because that was that's true television commentary. He, he didn't say very much, but what he said made such an impact. And television commentary is hard. Vic and I have both done it. It's difficult because you really shouldn't speak very much. And what you do say... You're relying, it has to be on the screen, mm -hmm. and you can't say the obvious. So mm -hmm. it actually doesn't leave you with very much to say. The great thing about Richie was his discipline. And I had to present um, the 1999 World Cup on BBC Telly because BBC had lost the rights for the series that followed, but we still had the World Cup mm -hmm. to do. And everyone shot off to Sky or Channel 4 or wherever, and it was left to Richie and me. And I, was, I hadn't done telly before. And the hardest part, of course, in our job, I think, is talking to time. The seconds tick away. Fine on the radio, see a watch. On telly, you've got that horrible mechanical voice in your headphones that starts at 59, 58, <laughs> 57. And the first one I did with Richie, in vision, in card, if I can see it now, I got it completely wrong and died a thousand deaths. You were supposed to say goodbye on naught. And he said, uh, that didn't go very well, Jonathan. I said, no, and Richie. He said, I've got an idea. And so we had a plan. As soon as 59, 58 started in, the, in my ear for the end of the programme, he had it as well, of course, I would ask him a question and he would talk to seven, by which point I would say, thanks, Richie. Look at the camera and say, well, there we go. What a great game today. Tomorrow, of course, it's West Indies versus mm. Australia. Until then, goodbye, naught. <laughs> yeah. And that's Richie. I mean, he's such a professional. And that was reflected in, in everything. I mean, he worked hard, he researched hard. It's just the way that Richie, Richie was. So he, he left nothing to chance. Let's hear from him then. His first brush with broadcasting came in 1956 when he was touring with the Australians and he fixed up a three-week course at the BBC. In 1956, we had a black-and-white television set in our uh, dressing room and uh, I was able to watch um, Dan Maskell doing the tennis and uh, Henry Longhurst doing the golf and I sensed instantly that here were two people who knew what they were doing because they seemed to be talking to an absolute minimum, using as few words as possible, but still getting uh, the story along to those who were watching. Uh, there were other people, Peter O'Sullivan, uh, he taught me something very valuable. He was uh, radio commentary then on uh, horse racing. I went along to say hello to him, and he said to me, uh, I understand you're going to be trailing around on my coattails for the next two days. I said, well, Mr. Sullivan, uh, it's very kind of you to allow me to do that. He said, there's only one small thing I want to impress on you. During the day, do not utter one word to me. Well, I looked at him and he said, that's all right. He said, at the end of the day, when we're finished, we will then go and have a beer or whatever you might like to drink. And I will go through the notebook you have kept at the day of everything I've done and the things that uh, impressed you most and the things you thought you might put into gear. So that was extremely valuable. Those people, Henry Longhurst, Dan Maskell, Peter O'Sullivan, they were the first three, although um, uh, you had uh, David Coleman who was around all the time and I was very, very impressed with him. He could do anything. I'm, I'm struck, Richie, that you said there that you were impressed that on occasions they used as few words as possible, that that struck you quite early on, maybe, that that was key. In that three weeks, the people I watched and listened to, I had the feeling they were putting a caption on the pictures on the television screen, and that allowed them uh, to use as few words as possible but still get the message across. And then when you started working um, in cricket in, in this country, Peter West, Tony Lewis, Jim Laker, of course, the great Brian Johnson, what were your initial impressions of the way they did the job? Well, Brian was, um, he was doing radio as well as, um, as television. But all those chaps, uh, they all, all had their own method. Uh, that was the other thing that they did. Uh, I thought to myself now, when you decide on a style, make sure that you're not just copying someone else. 
there were various things came up and I always take into the commentary box, even now, a little list of um, eight things just to remind me if I happen to have forgotten or I think, oh, I didn't uh, didn't do that very cleverly. I'll just, have, I'll just have a reminder of my list and I've been carrying that around for many, many years. For example, um, number two on the list is never ask a statement. And it is possible these days to hear statements being asked with the words uh, doesn't it or isn't it at the end of the sentence. And that's something uh, I was taught very early on not to do. But it's been a learning process and I still learn every time I go in to um, do some work for Channel 9 or whoever it might be. Richie, could you tell us a couple more things on that list? I think people will be fascinated by that because, you know, that, that, that as you say, is something that we, we all try to learn from the outset and yet you still carry that list with you. Uh, yes, I do. And... Uh, Never ask a statement is one of them. Uh, the other thing is uh, the phrase, of course. And I have known people who've put their boot through a television set at home uh, because of course is um, rather uh, talking down to the people who are in front of their sets. But uh, some of the other things on there are, um, you've got to remember that many viewers might never have played cricket and you've got to remember the value of the pause and that was given to me many, many years ago by Bob Menzies, the Australian Prime Minister, when he made a speech. I said to him, that was a very good speech, and he said, thank you. He turned away and came back, and he looked at me, and he said, always remember the value of the pause. Now, some of those things are things to do. Uh, some of them are things to avoid. You've always got to remember also, don't take yourself too seriously and make sure you have fun. Uh, that's so right, Richie. You, you are the master of the pause when it comes to cricket. And growing up, I know, and everybody listening will agree with this, that sometimes when we were watching and over and you were commentating, you might not say anything for four balls because there wasn't particularly something to say. My question is, that takes quite a lot of confidence in your own ability, doesn't it? That you feel well, you don't need to say something and you're confident not to say something because there's frankly nothing for you to add at that particular moment. Yeah, I think we get back then to what I mentioned earlier, that... When I say, or I'm doing, or I'm only doing this, and that's putting a caption on the picture, it's very important to be able to do that without sounding pretentious, without um, giving the people back in their homes the, the feeling that you're talking down to them. My main thing to keep telling myself is, uh, get the description and your story and your meaning over in as few words as possible, it uh, just doesn't mean being abrupt, but um, just uh, just try and do it that way. And always remember that the words we and they don't exist in any TV sports event. <laughs> Andy in Norfolk says, always love Richie's commentary during the World Cup in 1992. Wazim Akram's dismissal of Alan Lamb. He said, Alan Lamb has been cleaned up, perhaps. Deliberate pause. So too England. <laughs> he, well, the king of the pause. I mean, that, that, the point I made, I remember that so clearly as a kid, they go, there's nothing going on in this over because Richie hasn't said anything, so don't worry about it. Yeah, I mean, his silences yeah. were, were brilliant. <laughs> um, it's quite hard for him when he's been working recently for Channel 9 because I think they've had three commentators on simultaneously, probably doing 20-minute slots. And it's an absolute pearl if you hear Richie say anything in that 20 minutes. I think also what's changed is, is commercial television, in that when in those days we're talking about, there were no adverts. Mm. Uh, and so th they could chat between overs. But, of course, you can't do that now on, on most networks. Yeah. So you, you have to get your talking in before you have a commercial break. And that, that has changed the style of TV commentary. And the other thing you mentioned I think is quite important, maybe on the way, it's the notion of impartiality. Mm. It's not easy, especially when... England are playing Australia, even in our box, to remain totally impartial when you've got Jim Maxwell just gnashing <laughs> his teeth there. But I think it is a very important element of, of good commentary. Um, and Richie, it was the detail. I, I only worked with him once on television. I was, I was still a player down at a sort of a B&H match or something. And I always remember his solitary piece of advice to me, which was, 
they had microphones a bit like these here, sort of puffy <laughs> ends to them. Usually best if you just have your nose touching the top of the microphone. <laughs> and that was about it. <laughs> but if Richie Bennett, who's, forgot it, who's 83 in the autumn, can yeah. still take a piece of paper with him into Absolutely. a commentary box, which basically is saying that he is a professional to his fingertips and discipline, and says don't take yourself too seriously, yeah. then frankly, Aggers, there's no excuse for anybody to no. take themselves too seriously. Absolutely, but that, that, that is Richie, as I talked yeah. about. I mean, yeah. absolutely precision. Yeah. Uh, in, in, in every way. And yeah. at 83, I mean, doesn't he sound great? Oh. He's still, mm. still, still in good form. I should be on you if you say, of course, in a minute. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> or, or if I just throw out a statement. <laughs> and, and, to ask and, a statement. Exactly. And raise my voice right. at the end. Yes. In interviewing, uh, you often hear a statement oh. mm. and then mm. isn't it? Or, you know, all, yeah. It's almost as if the interviewer is trying to sound, you know, he's clever or something. But he's quite right. You're listening to Voices of Summer on Five Live, our celebration of the great cricket commentators, Jonathan Agnew and Vic Marks, are with me. You can text us on 85058 or you can tweet us at BBC Five Live or use the hashtag Voices of Summer. This is where we need Vic's particular expertise. We're talking about a key role now in radio cricket commentary, the expert summariser. Here's a reminder of some of TMS's finest. Tilding comes in and blows there, but he's building! His leg stump knocked right back past the middle stump. Well, Fred, what about that one? It's a sad thing for Tony Gregg. It's a sad thing for Tony Gregg, but what a magnificent delivery by holding. He knows this high backlift of Gregg's, which they've played on, and he came up the first delivery and bowled the perfect Yorker on the leg stump and knocked the leg stump right out of the ground, leaving Tony Gregg completely nonplussed. And the applause, very deserved applause, for the end of a marvellous, undefeated 149 by Botham. One of the great innings of Test cricket, of Test cricket of all time. It's the sort of innings which any great player would have been proud to play, including the likes of Sobers or that category of player. It was a stupendous innings. Here comes Hilford House. Oh, Peter. oh, don't, oh. T- don't touch it with your hand. Oh, dear. Oh. He, almost, he almost picked the ball up, in which case he would have been out. He would have been out handled the ball there. The ball was threatening his stumps. Just calm down, boys. Calm down. Do I have your name? Geoffrey Boycott. And your specialist chosen subject? Geoffrey Boycott. <laughs> Geoffrey Boycott was involved in 20 runouts in Test cricket, but how many involved himself and how many involved his partner? Most of them didn't run fast enough, Jonathan. <laughs> Let's answer the question. I can't. <laughs> you, do, you made that deal. Only seven were you. You ran out 13 of your partners. No! Which that, batsman no, did Geoffrey Boycott... didn't run fast enough. What vegetable did your mother use as a bat? <laughs> <laughs> Rhubarb. <laughs> Which episode of CSI did Jeff Boycott go to watch when he put down the phone during a BBC interview? <laughs> Not telling you. And what I like them all. Miami, Las Vegas. I like them all. This is an either or, A or B, multiple choice question. What sort of pitch did Jeff Boycott prefer to bat on? It's covered or uncovered? <laughs> uncovered. <laughs> uncovered. Well done, Jeffrey. I mean, pretty well. What did he get? <laughs> Well, that is just fantastic radio. Um, Jeffrey Boycott featuring Mm. a special tea time version of Mastermind with Aggers in India this winter. Yeah. (laughs) But but see, for people who think that Jeffrey hasn't got a sense of humour, there you go. (laughs) Jeffrey has got a very good sense of humour. You've got to to dig a bit sometimes to find it, but actually, not not too deep. Fred Truman, Trevor Bailey, Phil Tufnell in there as well as summarisers. What do you look for in a summariser? I think summarising is the hardest job. I, I couldn't summarise, because you've got to think of things to say all the time. The commentator, it's just happening. So that's by far the easiest. How these fellows, and Victor's now done it for over 20 years, it's easy when you first start it, when you're a freshly retired player, you come armed with lots of fresh stories and uh, all a little bit, you know, you, you are in the know with the players. That's easy. Um, it's what comes when you're actually not that close to them anymore. And to, to be, still be coming up with insight and, and, and humour uh, and all of that 20 years down the line is, is really something. They're all different, um, just as commentators are all different. All of the summarisers are very different. I used to love working with Fred. Um, I don't know what's going off out there. Uh, he would often say that after, before even, in fact, once, famously, <laughs> before the first ball of the match had even been bowled, uh, he claimed he didn't know what was going off out there. <laughs> Trevor, very succinct. Again, uh, if, if he called somebody a good player, 
That was just about the, the highest accolade you could ever award. I suspect Don Bradman might have been a great player, but no one else. Why was he called the Boyle, Trevor? Oh, that was where did that come from? That was a, a, a story involving. I think you've tested me here. A football <laughs> commentary uh, in a match involving a dug in soul. Uh, it's 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 not got nothing to do with Brian at all, uh, but the PA announcer in in Holland, I think it was, yeah. announced them as um, Insol and Boyle over the PA oh, system. Okay. So it was a simple. Oh, it, so wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't. It wasn't. Nothing to do with cricket. No, it no. wasn't. No, it was actually football. What what is your approach to summarising? If I can ask such a question, or <laughs> well, you don't want to analyse it too much, but. Um, I actually disagree with that because I think commentating must be is much harder than summarising. Uh, basically, what you have to do is you sit there and you've just got to remember, and we always forget this sometimes, to shut up when the bloke is running up to bowl. That's mm. all you really have to do. Uh, or when something big happens. Or when, oh, yes, if there's a wicket yeah. or a, a landmark because they'll be replaying it and the commentators get a bit sniffy if you keep interrupting <laughs> them when they this is a great clip that we played in 20 oh, years yes. time by a program hosted by your successor when we were <laughs> some young I don't know who it'll be will be talking about aggers in in in, in sort of <laughs> lordly tones but you've got to so you've got to shut up when the match is won or a wicket's fallen yes. and you've got to shut up when the bloke's running up, but to are bowl. you looking at a theme that is developing? If if there's a spell of off-spin bowling, I'm not just saying that because you're an off-spin. Are you looking at a theme that's developing? When Graham Swan's bowling, are you thinking, he's, I can see what he's doing there. He's bowling into the footmarks. He's bowling around the wicket or whatever. Or is it just instinctive? I mean, you've been in the game so long that that you don't well, have to well, think what, about it that deeply. What, what you can't do is prepare anything. I mean, mm. occasionally you try. I think, well, that's all so good. Mm-hmm. And you might even jot down a few. And once you do that and you actually try and deliver it, for me anyway, it's a disaster. Mm-hmm. So you just sit there and instinctively, if Graham Swan's bowling, I'll still sort of, you know, put myself in his shoes and wish I'd worn them <laughs> far more frequently. Uh, and you'll have a rough idea what he's up to and you'll see what he's up to and you'll admire what he's up to and you'll be able to spot that, you know, he's coming around the wicket for this or whatever it is. Um but I don't think you want to sort of analyse it too much um, uh, about how you go about it, but you've just got to remember to shut up. They'll glare at you if you don't in the end. <laughs> Robbo says, boycott's my favourite. I just love his opinionated approach, a, two bre- a breath of fresh air in today's PC media savvy world. He came up with the corridor of uncertainty, didn't he? And yes. somebody says, a pundit who can coin a phrase that ends up in the sports vernacular must be doing something yeah, right. Uh, that, was, that was his, and it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a lovely line, isn't it? I mean, Jeffrey, Jeffrey is brilliant. Um, he, he particularly analysing batting technique. Mm-hmm. You'll look at somebody play, uh, just maybe an over or two, and that's enough. And uh, you know that that is very much his his subject. Of course, he does go for headlines. You know, he knows the value of a of a boycott comment, mm-hmm. and it served him very well all of his seventy three or mm-hmm. years or so. You know, he is highly in demand. He is very disciplined. He's never late. He's always there. Get the rubbish off. The door opens, and in he comes, storming, storming through. I made you. Know. you. <laughs> and yeah, and he, he, he can't. I mean, people often wonder about my relationship with Jeffrey. I mean, we, we are, I suppose, an unlikely couple, really. Um, but we've always respected each other when we were playing each other. So I mean, he let. I mean, I, I tease him terribly, really. Um, mm. It's amazing what I can get away with with Jeffrey. But he takes it and comes bouncing back. <laughs> Can I, I want to ask a question to you about summarising? Because you were a test player yourself. I mean, uh, is there ever a, a, an issue when you're asking Vic something? You know, y- you could be a summariser. You were a test player yourself. Do you know what I mean? Sometimes are you asking a question that you probably do know the answer to? Oh, possibly, but I was such a bad test player. That no, you were still a test player. Yeah, but it sort of and, doesn't uh, matter. But I, I often think this. Look, it happens in cricket, it happens in football. When you have got former pros who yes. are the presenter or the commentator, they quite often might know right, the answer. Well, well, I, a, I don't know what the answer is. It's, I have no it's idea. a good point because, uh, particularly since Christopher died, there has been this a, a bit of a, co- a commentary about journalists, about England players, England captains being in the commentary box. And it, in the radio, I think, I think it actually is primarily a TV debate. Yeah. On the radio, we still have people who can come in and they haven't played test cricket. It's quite it would be difficult, I think, not to have the man, the expert summariser, which we have in... It's very clearly defined in radio. Mm. It's, it's not in television anymore uh, because they've all done it. Um, no, they it need be, to be a pre- ex-player, definitely. They, they yes. do. Oh, absolutely. But it would be very... It, it, yeah, I mean, the man sitting beside on my right yeah. needs to have played Test cricket. Otherwise, it, yeah, it, it, it would be a bit strange. 
I mean, he's quite good at not... He knows the answers to yeah. most of the questions, or he, he's got a strong view, yeah. and, and sometimes you'll, we'll have a conversation about it. We might disagree. Yeah. Uh, but he's also... There's a lot of journalists in Agus, uh, and he's been a journalist longer than he's been a cricketer, uh, and he doesn't ask. I mean, sometimes perhaps new commentators who are ex-players, they just haven't got enough time because instinctively they want to comment as well as describe and it's it's you can't fit it all in no, you, can't. you can't do one or the other um, bob says great memories of sadly departed voices i'd add one more i really miss bill frindle his calm uh -huh. tones and authority on the game were peerless but he was the cornerstone of the program bill really if you think the contribution that he made um you know he, he scored meticulously to the extent that if the scoreboard was wrong you knew that bill was right uh, and and he scored beautifully. It's incredible. I could go to Bill doing this job now and say, oh, God, I've, I've forgotten how uh, Michael Vaughan got to his 100 or something, mm. Bill, uh, two days ago. What what was the shot that he played? And he'll go through this extraordinary system of arrows and stars. I, I'd never worked any of it out. And he'll say, oh, yes, he, he clipped it for two mm. just, just, to, just behind square off, off McGrath. Thanks, Bill. Uh, you know, he could tell. And while all that was going on, of course, we were teasing him. He was answering ridiculous questions, either from us or from, or from listeners as well, digging into his, file, his files and folders. I mean, we're talking just really the start of the internet, really, for, for, you know, only at the end of Bill's career. He was relying on books and folders and sheets uh, to get his information from. Uh, he, he was remarkable. He, he, his contribution to that programme... Um, is, 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 is as easily as big as anybody's. Just before we go to the news, I must just tell you about Monday Night and Five Live Sport in the first of our series of Flintoff's Ashes Legends. Andrew Flintoff is joined in the studio by the other three fast bowlers who helped win back the Ashes in 2005 after 18 years of Australian dominance. <laughs> So Langer, who's on 14, waits for the fair-haired Hoggard, and he bowls. Oh, and he's caught behind! Langer's out to Hoggard's first ball of the day. So Jones from the nursery end, Martin goes back, and he's caught behind. behind. He's out. Oh, first ball. Jeez. What a wicket. <clears throat> and comes Flintoff. He bowls to him, and oh, he's out, caught behind. What a wicket for England. And Andrew Flintoff, well, he's yelling. He's like a man possessed. He's baying. He's bellowing. Harmison comes up and bowls, and Kasparovic goes back and parries one as he caught down the leg side. There's an appeal for a catch. He's out. England have won. England have won by two runs. The bales are removed by umpire Bowden. He throws one in the air. And England have won the Ashes. Steve Harmison, Matthew Hoggard, Simon Jones joining Andrew Flintoff on Monday night from half past seven on Five Live Sport. On Tuesday, a special Tuffers and Vaughan, 20 years to the day after the ball of the century. They're joined by Shane Warner, Mike Gatting to relive one of the most famous deliveries in Ashes history, 20 years on. Coming up after the news, we'll talk about Brian Johnston, what he means to TMS, and yes, we will play the leg over clip in full. After the news with Faye Rusco. On digital radio, digital TV, mobile and online. This is BBC Radio 5 Live. Mark Bridger will spend the rest of his life behind bars after being found guilty of murdering April Jones in mid Wales last year. He abducted the five year old as she played with a friend near her home in McCunthleth. He told police he'd accidentally run her over. Her body has never been found. Today, Bridger nodded as the judge described him as a pathological liar. Owen Smith is the Shadow Secretary of State for Wales. All of us who are parents can't really imagine how awful it must be and how uh, destructive it must be, not just of the, the, that child's life, April's life, but of the lives of all of the people who loved her and, of course, that won't go away ever. Speaking after the sentencing from outside Mould Crown Court, April's parents said she would be forever in their hearts and paid tribute to the local community for their support. Police are continuing to question a 22-year-old man arrested on suspicion of murdering a missing teenage girl from Shropshire. 17-year-old Georgia Williams from Wellington has not been seen since Sunday. Superintendent Nav Malik is from West Mercia Police. I make it very clear, folks, that we have not found Georgia, Georgia Williams at this moment in time. She remains 
elsewhere, we're not quite sure where. We are really, really keen to identify where she may be, her whereabouts, and I urge the public to support us to try and identify where she may be. A man accused of killing the soldier, Lee Rigby, has been remanded in custody and will appear before the Old Bailey on Monday. 22-year-old Michael Adabawale, who was shot by police after the attack last week, has been charged with murder. President Assad of Syria has vowed his forces will respond to any future Israeli strike on his country. In a television interview, he also claimed the Syrian army had scored major victories against rebels and now held the balance of power in the conflict. The European Commission is taking the government to court over restrictions on benefits for EU nationals. The government's dismissed the claim and insists the UK's additional residency checks prevent abuse of the welfare system. And provisional Met office figures suggest this spring will turn out to be the coldest for more than 50 years. The average temperature so far has been just 6 degrees Celsius. Sport tonight, Frankie Dottori will return to racing tomorrow after being cleared by the French racing authorities after the completion of his six-month drugs ban. He'll ride in the first two races at Epsom. Mark Hughes says his remit is to establish Stoke as a top-half team in the Premier League after taking over this morning from Tony Pulis. World number one, Novak Djokovic cruised through to the third round of the French Open. Rafa Nadal will play his second-round match tomorrow after rain washed out much of the day's play. Rory McIlroy carded a first round 6 over 78 at the Memorial Championship in Ohio. He's 13 strokes behind the leader and New Zealand will be without fast bowler Trent Bolt for the one-day series against England, which starts at Lords tomorrow. He hasn't recovered from the side strain suffered in the last Test match. Five Live Breakfast. The UN Secretary-General Ban Ki-moon is raising the concerns about the growing slaughter of endangered elephants, rhinos, tigers and other species. Let's speak to Will Travis, Chief Executive of the Wildlife charity the Born Free Foundation. This is the first time to my knowledge that this issue has been raised at such a globally important forum. People like John Kerry, William Hague, they've all expressed grave concerns about the effect on animals and people. The evidence that we have, some of the ivory is then sold to raise funds to buy arms for some of these insurgent militias in different parts of Africa. Five Live Breakfast. Weekday mornings from six. Good evening from Mark Pugach. Welcome back to the second hour of Voices of Summer, five live sports tribute to the great cricket commentators, and none were greater than these two men. You've got to be a natural talker because there's a time when a fast bowler walks back to his mark when you've got a devil of a lot of filling in to do, which is a contemplative game, you see. It is a game that produces art, painting, writing, poetry, and I suppose commentary is just a step down from that. Can I use the word friendliness? People say to me, um, you know, marvellous, the cricket is so friendly, and I think this is it. They feel they're listening to friends, are watching a game on their behalf, and if that's, I think, the main secret of it. It, it is popular, there's no question of that, and people love it uh, for the fact that uh, they feel they've got some friends talking to them. The voice of cricket, known in this country and around the rest of the world. One of a very small number of uh, cricket commentators over the years who've become part of a national institution. I've been listening to Brian for more years than I care to remember. I've collected a lot of puns, most of which I wouldn't dream of repeating uh, during these many years I've been listening to him. That was the voice of the former Prime Minister, Sir John Major, paying tribute to Brian Johnston. We also heard at the start the unmistakable deep tones of John Arlott. Jonathan Agnew and Vic Marks are with me. And joining us for this part of the programme, Brian Johnston's son, Barry. Barry, good evening to you. Good evening, Mark. Uh, you've written and edited books about your father as well. He passed away in 1994. But do you sense an, an enduring love for him and his broadcasting to this day? I do, and I think the leg of it has a, a strong <laughs> responsibility for that because it keeps his voice fresh. But um, I, I go around the country and talk to lots of people, and, uh, and people have long memories, and people grew up listening to him. One forgets that he was doing television commentary for nearly 50 years, so uh, a lot of people heard him. And I, as he said there, I think they thought of him as a friend because he came into their homes and uh, they got to know him so well, and, and I think that's why his memory lives on. Agus, you've written a book called Thanks, John. Is, is TMS what it is today largely because of Brian Johnston? I think it is, and I think it's the, the style is what people around the world 
copy. I think it's Brian's legacy in a way. Wherever you know, if you go to New Zealand, you go to Australia, working on their local networks, you find the same thing, which is uh, is absolutely right. It's people being nice, being mm. friendly. I mean, if you're not if you're not friendly. I think people probably switch you off, wouldn't they? I mean, you do go into people's homes, you go into their lives. And that was Brian. I mean, Brian made a huge impression on me, sitting next door to him. Because I, I, my first year, I, I sat beside him and I was a summariser. I wasn't a commentator. And so just being part of, 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 of what he was doing, of, of, of watching him... Being serious, being funny, um, when to throw a line away, when to read a letter... Um, and, and how to communicate. That, that's what Brian really did. It didn't matter how many millions of people were listening to Brian. Uh, the point is that you yourself would just feel he was talking to you. It's an incredible skill. And only, again, radio can do it. And only a very few people, like Brian Johnston, Terry Wogan, I think probably another one, uh, who actually have that ability to reach out and touch individual people. Barry, interesting that Agus mentions just in radio, because, of course, he was in television for a long time, but it's radio really where everybody remembers him, as it were. Well, yes, I mean, he started in television in, in 1946 and uh, did it for 24 years, and uh, so he sort of created the art of television commentary because it hadn't really been done before. But he said himself that he was more suited to radio because, as you were saying earlier, if, if you're doing television commentary, you're tied to the pictures and what the viewers can see at home, whereas on radio you actually paint the picture. Uh, and also there's long pauses when not much is happening, and, and that suited him down to the ground because he could read out a listener's letter or tell a joke or tell a funny story that had happened. Um, Whereas always sticking to the cricket, he he was uh, he came across as a bit of a joker, but as Agus will tell you, he mm. was supreme professional. I mean, he knew exactly what he was doing. Yes. Well, as we hear now, he was a versatile commentator, not just in cricket. No, is it? Is it the Ashes? Yes, England have won the Ashes. What a welcome! And now I get my first sight of the bride, and down the steps will come the two bridesmaids who will accompany they're waiting for her now. Here's Hilda coming up to bowl to Thompson. Bowls this one. And Thompson has a wild hit at that one and Murray throws it and he's out stumped. He is out. Murray threw the ball down and thing and Australia have been beaten. West Indies have won. West Indies have won by 17 runs, I think if my mathematics are correct. They're off! They're off! And Oxford are gone off here on the middle six side. It looks as if Oxford might slightly in the lead. We're a little bit behind. We're racing ahead to try and catch up now. But now he's got three jumps to go, and he's um, in the lead with only four faults. And he's cleared the first one, and now there's this double oxer. But he clears it all right, and now for the parallel bars. And he's in the lead. In comes Sobers, well pitched up and driven hard into the ground there, and fielded by Sobers himself and a no-ball call by Arthur Fagg, pointing majestically towards Father Time because the scorers sit up in a little open window there. It's a marvellous view of the ground. Have you ever been up the top of the scoreboard there, Richie? No, I haven't. Well, it's worth going. It's a, it's a marvellous view, sideways on, but you look right down on the play. In comes service again. This one, a little bit short, and off the back foot. Nice forcing stroke, coming up for four runs to the Warner's Town. What a lovely stroke that was. Oliveira, with very strong forearms, and punches the ball away, anything short like that. Well, Athens waits now as Border comes up to bowl to him. And he flicks this one away, and that may be it. No, Murphy is no. going to cut it off, is he? Yes, he's going to cut it off down at mid-wicket. They've run two, and they're going for the third. This one. No, he's going to be run out. He's run out. <laughs> Atherton is run out. Sent back by Gatting. Stranded. Murphy throws, and he is run out now for 99. And he's coming back. Helmet off. That was a disaster for England. That run out of Michael Atten in 1999, John's final year, uh, in 1993, 499 was John's final year as a TMS commentator. Uh, Barry Johnson, his son, is, is with us. He presented Down Your Way, Barry, for many years on Radio 4. In some ways, th that sort of game was complementary with what he did with TMS, the way that he went about presenting that programme. Well, it was, and I found it interesting after he died, talking to people, that there were some that actually never really listened to him doing cricket commentary but knew him only from Down Your Way, which went out on Sunday afternoons for, for many, many years. He did it for 15 years, um, 733 programmes, and he absolutely loved it because each week they went to a different town or a village or uh, a factory or somewhere around the country, and they talked to six people. Uh, about where they worked, where they lived, the traditions and the, the characters and so on. And it was a, a wonderful opportunity for him to meet 
people around the country and it didn't make any difference to him whether you were a duke or a dustman you were all the same to him and so he came across as just this natural chap and in fact he never called them interviews he called them conversations and that's what they were and i think that's why they work so well ian says my abiding memories of presenting john as with a chocolate cake before the start <laughs> of play at a noble test match in the 80s and then listening to him eat it live on air <laughs> an hour or so later so before lunch Barry, can you remember how the whole cake and TMS business started? Yes, it was very simple. His birthday was the 24th of June, uh, which often came during the Lord's Test match. And I think it was when he was 70, uh, there was a big fuss being made about it, and, and somebody sent a cake. And being very polite, he said, uh, you know, someone's had a very nice cake here, thank you very much, Mrs Smith, or whatever her name was. And uh, the next day, of course, an another cake appeared from somebody else, and so he thanked them. And, and this flood of cakes kept coming through. And uh, it just became a tradition. And uh, he used to tell me that he'd turn up outside the pavilion at Lord's on a, uh, the first day of a test and there'd be three or four people standing there with cakes ready to present them. And it became a bit of a joke, but uh, it was just one of these lasting things. Of course, he used to try and catch people out. There's a famous story when Alan McGilvray was in the box and uh, Brown was commentating and they had a bit of cake next to him and he'd cut out a slice and pointed to Alan McGilvray and, uh, you know, said, have a bit, and waited till McGillers had got his mouth absolutely full of cake and said, yes, well, that was an interesting ball there. Let's uh, ask McGilvray what he thought of it. And the <laughs> crumbs flew all over the studio. <laughs> He refused to eat even a sweet after that. But that was sort of humanising the programme. I mean, I think before Brian arrived at TMS, lovely poetic description, of course, of the cricket. But I think you probably had to be a cricket fan to listen to Test Match Special before Brian came. And with the cakes, the letters, the word games, the fun, he just opened it out to a, to a whole new audience. Yeah. Vic, you had to, you had to be quite uh, single-minded about the cakes, didn't you? Otherwise, you could all be the size of houses by the end of the summer. <laughs> well, it just depends. Yes, you have to do that. And I'm struggling a little bit in that department, but um, you have to trust the person next to you too <laughs> if you're going to start eating. Uh, and you could probably trust John because he did. He he was the old style commentator who would commentate through the over unless something remarkable happened. But he was an old pro, and, and you'll remember. Do you remember when something called Radio Five Live? No, came? I've never heard of it. <laughs> anyway, it came up. Uh, there was this new program, Radio Five Live, and he wound you up, hadn't he? Somehow. And they set up, Peter Baxter set oh, up a right. sort of spoof recording. Right, we want 20 seconds. It can't be 19, it can't be 21. Uh, it's about the ashes and we want you to really give it some month, John. Dip in the music. Yes, yeah. right. And, of, and like it, was a, it was a very good sort of wind-up, this, except that he did it yeah, absolutely did. perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> so it didn't quite work in the end, did it? Do you remember? Brilliant radio man. John has always followed the advice of the BBC's post-war head of outside broadcasts. I'm not making this man's name up. It is Seymour de lot bitnier He was a great one on the rhythm of commentary, which I think is absolutely right. About cricket, he said the game stops very frequently, but it does start the moment a bowler starts his run, and at that moment you've got to give a complete picture of what is happening until the ball becomes dead again, and then use what we always used to call associative material. I suppose nowadays we'd say our jokes or anything else or things about... Uh, what's going on on the ground, but never uh, miss the rhythm of that. And I think that is absolutely vital to cricket commentary. And he's laid that down. He was the architect of commentary. Well, this has been requested by so many people, Aggers. Here uh, it comes. Gareth Evans, Bra Maloney, Simon Jowett, Gordon Challoner, Andy Young says, I still remember having to pull over. Obviously, you're driving. I wasn't the only one. It's Friday the 9th of August, 1991. It's the close of the second day of the final test at the Oval. England taking on the West Indies. And Jonas, with Jonathan here, is in the midst of his end-of-day summary. Both of them at the end out <laughs> most extraordinary way. He knew, this is the tragic thing about it, he knew exactly what was going to happen. He tried to step over the stumps and just flicked a bail with his, with his right hand. He modest and tried to do the splits over it and unfortunately uh, the inner part of his thigh must have just removed the bail. He just didn't quite get his leg over. Anyhow, he, he did very well indeed, batting 131 minutes and hit three fours. And um, then we had Lewis playing extremely well before his 47 not out. Agus, do stop it. Uh, and he was joined by De Freitas, who um, was in for 40 minutes, a useful little partnership there. Uh, they put on 35 in 40 minutes, and then he was caught by Dujan Walsh. Um, Lawrence, uh, always entertaining, batting for 30, 35. <laughs> 35 minutes, hit a four. Over the week, he was... <laughs> Angus, for goodness sake, stop it. <laughs> he had 
There's Lawrence. Lawrence played extremely well. He hit a four over the weekkeeper's head. And he was out for nine. And Tuffle came in. Batted for 12 minutes. And then was caught by Haynes on Patson for two. And there were 54 extras. And he got all out for 419. I've stopped laughing now. Well, that, I think, was voted the most popular sports radio clip of all time in this country. But actually, underneath it all, you, you were... Well, you, he wasn't very happy, no, or no. you weren't very well, happy. Well, it was my first summer, yeah. and I just remember the terror gripping me halfway through when this, this programme was collapsing. Yeah. Uh, he couldn't speak, I couldn't speak, and when I had a go at Lawrence... It was because Peter Baxter, if you do if you do listen to it again, just in the background, you can hear a bit of a... Mm-hmm. It's Peter Baxter saying, will somebody say something through clenched teeth? Because, of course, with 20,000 people at the Oval, you couldn't hear the squeaks and the wheezes and everything. It makes it actually very funny. It was just like silence. Um, and I, I, it's an awful feeling where, A, you can't speak because you're, 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 you're laughing, but, B, I just thought, this is actually not very funny. This is bad. Mm-hmm. And Brian, and um, Barry might remember this, I'm sure he might have Barry. You were home, Barry, when he went home? I know he, he, he stomped out of the commentary box really not happy at all because he just felt he'd been unprofessional and actually yeah. wasn't funny and it, yeah. it sort of let the side down. And it was only the next day... Uh, did you think you, did you think I oh, put in my copybook? It was, yes, I did. I mean, my, I say, it was my first summer, yeah. and I remember writing my reports in the deserted commentary box. Peter went with him. They both stomped off. Um, and I remember writing my reports saying it might not have been a great career move, really. <laughs> but, of course, with letters in those days, they, arriving the next morning, and this mountain appeared. And, and um, I got there early, and I'd heard it. Radio 4 played it, the Today programme. I thought, this is funny. This is brilliant. <laughs> God, it's good. And, and he turned up. And uh, I, I wasn't quite sure what his reaction would be, but he started to open a few letters. And one was from Ronnie Corbett's wife, actually. <laughs> I mean, bizarrely. <laughs> one of the hundreds that were saying, you know, I was in the, uh, no. the Dartford Tunnel or something. And, you know, and, and so he began to, began to cheer up. Yeah. And I said, come on, we've got to be, Brian, I've heard it. Let's go down to the engineer's room and go listen to this, because you, you will love it. And, of course, down we went, and we opened the door, and they were already franking copies off down there on the cassette, <laughs> and then you were the one to win it. But you, when you said it, you must have known what you were doing. Well, no, because it wasn't my line. I stole it from John Etheridge, you see, from The Sun. Um, <laughs> uh, it, so you did well, know what you were doing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it just came out, because he was just being a bit risque and silly. Yeah. I mean, basically, so this was my first summer. Yeah. I was an expert summariser, and bear in mind that the other experts, apart from Victor, were Fred Truman... Mm-hmm. And Trevor Bailey. I mean, I really think Brown spent much of that summer wondering who I was. You know, I mean, it was ridiculous. So this was the first time I'd sat beside him after all those years of listening to him on the farm. Um, and I think he was testing me out a bit, and I was a bit anxious anyway, because this was like a dream time, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's why it just came out, honestly. It just, it just came out. Um, and, well, I'm rather glad it did, actually. Yeah. <laughs> ba- Barry, what is your memory of, of what your father said immediately afterwards, maybe that night, if you, if you have a recollection? Well, I wasn't at home that night, yeah. I, I, but I did hear it in my flat in Brighton as it happened, and I, I spoke to him later, and he was mortified, as, as mm. Agar says. I mean, he, he was then, what, about 78, something like that, mm. and I think he thought the BBC would think that he completely lost control and, and his career was over, you know, that he just couldn't hack it anymore. And it was only the next day when he came in and there were all these letters that he thought it might not be quite so bad. Yeah. But I remember uh, at the beginning of 1993, so about 18 months after that, he started doing a one-man show around the country and I helped him put some tapes together and we put this on a cassette and he used to play it at the end of the show in, in these theatres with, what, 1,000 people, that kind of thing. And it was the first time he'd ever played it in front of an audience and that's when he realised the reaction it got, because you'd have people weeping with laughter in the audience, and that's when he thought, actually, this is great fun. Mm. And he was always very proud of it after that, I think. I still play it now. And the, the nice thing now is that there are people who obviously weren't alive when it happened and perhaps hadn't heard it before. And you can see them, you know, age 20 or so, absolutely howling with laughter. I mean, it, it, it will live. It'll live forever. Well, I, I, guess... played it, I played it to some uh, sixth form boys at Warwick School about a month ago. <laughs> um, they'd never heard of Brian. Uh, very few of them uh, listened to TMS, I'm afraid. And I played this, and they were in hysterics as well. So <laughs> it, it still works. Uh, Agus, you've succeeded, Brian, in conducting the View from the Boundary interviews during lunchtime. But I don't think you've ever sung on air, have you? And you are Certainly musical. not. No, I mean, you're not going to get me to, are you? No. Not like this. This is Jonas with Roy Hudd during his final view from the boundary in 1993. One, two, three. 
Underneath the arches, we dream our dreams away. Underneath the arches, on cobblestones we lay. Every night you'll find us tired out and worn. Happy when the daylight comes creeping, bum, 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 bum. heralding the dawn. Yeah, sleeping when it's raining, and sleeping when it's fine. What's above there? Ba, ba, ba. Trains rattling by above. Ba, boo, boo, ba, 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 boo. Pavement is a pillar. Does it matter what's up? No matter where we are. Underneath the arches, we dream our dreams away. <laughs> and that's <laughs> jazz. <laughs> Did he choose that very particularly? Well, as, as Barry will, will say, that was his song. And uh, I think I'm right in saying, Barry, it was the one song that he could play on the piano. He sort of or he forced himself to learn it, didn't he? And that was his party piece. Well, it was the last song he'd play on the piano. I mean, in his uh, 20s, I think he played the piano quite well. Um, he lived in London at the time, and he, he used to spend his evenings going to the music halls and the variety theatres, and his great heroes were Max Miller and Flanagan yes. and Allen, and, of course, that was their theme tune, and that's, that's where he picked it up. And his dream was always to really go on the boards and um, be a stand-up comic, I think, but uh, with his background, that wasn't possible. And so it was wonderful to uh, see him later in life doing these one-man shows where he could actually tell jokes and be on the stage and finish with a little song at the end. Fantastic. I'm going to get a, a musical view in a second, but Vic, what about what about Jonas and the singing and cakes and the leg over and all that? Well, I, I, I wasn't doing that test, but I remember turning up on the Saturday. You'd obviously got over it by about Saturday morning because I remember you grabbing me and saying, come and have a listen to this. And I had a clue what I was going to hear. <laughs> oh, you hadn't heard it before? No, 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 no. no. And, I thought, and you know how it's a, it's a slow burner. I thought, yeah. why is he getting me to listen to this? Yeah. Yeah. And then I, well, I, we were still in stitches ten minutes yeah, ago. We it was were. hopeless. Isn't it? <laughs> Joining us now is a man who we can describe as a cricket nut and can give us, a, if you like, an alternative <laughs> broadcaster's perspective. The Radio 2 presenter, Bob Harris, is with us. Bob, great <laughs> to have you with us. Good evening. I, I was just thinking as you were talking about that, the number of people in, in even recent months, Jonathan, that you could have done duets with. I think in no, particular, no, no, no. Alice Cooper. Oh, you think? Yes. And, uh, and certainly Roy Harper would have been a very Just interesting... Just behave, thank you, <laughs> So what about Jonas' singing voice, first of all, Bob? Where, where would you pitch that? Um, somewhere around C minor. Yeah. <laughs> so cricket, what part has cricket commentary played in your life, as it were? Uh, huge, actually, I, I must say. It, it's so interesting to hear you all discussing... Um, um, the joy of it and the art of it, because the, the art of commentary, there is an art to it. And there, there are quite a number of different levels to it, as far as I'm concerned, because obviously the most important thing is to impart information as to what you're seeing in front of you. So as a radio listener, we're able to to get the facts as to what's just happened, whether this ball has hit the boundary rope or whether it's been a forward defensive stroke or whatever it is. Then you've got the summariser who... I think one of the key jobs of a summariser is to explain about the game things that one doesn't know. In other words, you know, I was reading something very interesting recently that Gary Neville was saying about the art of football punditry. It's, you know, it's dead easy to say when you see a fantastic 30-yard shot go into the back of the net, mm. what a fantastic shot that was. Mm. Of course, it's absolutely stating the obvious, and what you want your summariser to do is to give you some information that makes you think, wow, I... I didn't know that. And then, of course, then you've got the other situation of sort of contextualising all of this within a picture. And, I mean, I think this is one of the things that uh, John Harlett was so absolutely brilliant at doing. Mm. It was almost like, you know, an, an audio oil painting because you've got a picture of the ground, of the surroundings of the ground, the kind of people... You know, Henry Blofeld does this a little bit, doesn't yes. he, with the London buses and everything. It's a different style. <laughs> but so, yeah, yeah, but so, so you've got all these different aspects to commentary that, that add more and more. I think you make an interesting point because obviously these two are the pros and the test players, and you two, are, us two, are the cricket lovers and, and the hundreds of thousands listening. But um, 
but cricket is a bit more complex than that, and I think interesting you make the point about batting. You know, when I listen to Jeffrey uh, Boycott and Michael Vaughan now, I mean, he, they really do tell me as a listener things about batting. Football is a bit more obvious, isn't it? <laughs> you know, and I'm not saying there aren't great pundits because there are, but it's a you can see it a bit more obviously, can't you? But with batting, it's a little bit more sophisticated, isn't technical, it? Technical, terribly technical, yeah. isn't it? And it's really interesting when they say something and you go, "Listen, all oh, right, I, I yeah. really understand what you mean by yeah. that." And also, it's subjective. I mean, you might yeah. disagree with Jeffrey. Yeah. You know, mm. have it quietly. <laughs> <That's what laughs> <laughs> for everybody when he's not in the room, yeah. actually. But, you know, no, but it's, it's hard to disagree with him when he, but it's, it's hard to disagree with him if he's saying something technical but about yeah, why a bat's because he, will, because he will be right. Yes, yeah. yeah. You know, he will be right. Yeah. Whereas it's a bit more obvious if a bloke's not passing the ball very well to somebody in the same coloured shirt. That's happened yeah. quite often last night at Wembley. You know, yeah. it's a bit more obvious, that, isn't it? And that's where, you know, cricket, I don't know what you feel, Bob, has that sort of extra layer of depth of understanding, doesn't it, when you, when you, are, when you are like us, the amateur? It absolutely does. And, and just dipping back to football for one quick second but you know if somebody substituted for example what you want the summarizer to do is now explain to you the new shape and how this is going to yeah. change the shape of the yeah. team and what impact the substitution is going to have it, it happens all too rarely quite frankly yeah. whereas listening to to the cricket summarizers um the, you do get a sense of well fantastic depth of knowledge yeah. obviously <laughs> Uh, but a kind of seasoned view. I mean, the seen it all before view, but not cynical. Yeah. Yeah. We do have more time. I think yeah. that's where we are yeah. lucky with cricket. Yeah. Mm. We do have time to, yeah. to well, endless time sometimes. Oh, by the way, that reminds me, sort of David Pleat sends his very best oh, last night because I was at Wembley with him and I was about to say, oh, just talk me through an Agus football interview. Oh, and I thought, no, no I, we won't go down there we, with Leicester David City. Very, very <laughs> gentle with me. <laughs> just, just one thing, because I only just arrived, just come yeah. across from Radio 2, I've just been on air there and I don't know to what extent you were talking about uh, Brian Johnson and the, uh, the, the Michael Holding Holding and Willie. Yes. Never did happened. You, it, did it not happen? No, Bob. I've not happened. Shut at your, your... He's looking so disappointed. Bob's going to leave now. <laughs> Sorry. The, the bowl is holding yeah. the batsman's Willie. Well, then, I, so that was never no. said. I have got a tweet here which says, I believe it came from... Uh, uh, is, is Barry Johnston will, still with us? Barry, are you still there? Barry's no, still I'm with still us. still here, yes. Uh, it said, I've got a tweet here which says, I believe it came from a story in a letter to Jonas from an old lady who was worried oh, that not. young children <laughs> may have heard the remark during TMS. Where did this myth start, Barry? With him. Um, <laughs> with him. He started it and perpetuated well, I don't know. it. I, and Blower swears that he was in the commentary box when he said it, but... Um, <laughs> it's I, not I, a very good source. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I've been through all the archives and um, I listened to him being interviewed time and time again and I've got clips of so many interviews and he never says... I said it. He always says, and then there's the one which um, I never knew that I'd said, or uh, yeah. then there's the one that a lady wrote to me and told me that I'd said. So yeah. he yeah. never admitted it, and he was a very honest man, so I think that was a bit of a giveaway, that yes. it was one of the ones that, you know, it was too good to resist. He would love to have and, said and, it, wouldn't he? Yeah. Yeah, he'd love to have said <laughs> it. And so by saying, you know, a lady wrote in and said, do you yes. realise what you said, he could get away with Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Barry, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you My very pleasure. much. Bye, Barry. Just talking about, you know, the BBC needs everything double sourced these days, so blowers really doesn't stand <laughs> up, does it? I think you need a couple more. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, Lydia Jane, in tears, laughing at Agus and John's leg over wonderful stuff. Kim says, Radio Magic. Eddie Mailer, the best bit of commentary ever, crying with laughter. And Jules in London will speak for a lot of people like Jules. As a blind listener myself, I absolutely love the detailed and atmospheric images you describe, especially when you're a part of the world which I've never visited. Bob's going to stay with us for half an hour. We'll play you some of the other voices who've graced the airwaves after the news and, of course, that includes a focus on the life and commentary of John Arlott. Here's Faye Rusco with the news at 9.31. On digital radio, digital TV, mobile and online. This is BBC Radio 5 Live. Mark Bridges has been convicted of killing five-year-old April Jones in mid-Wales. He's been told he'll spend the rest of his life in prison. The abduction of April in October last year led to the largest search operation in British policing history. Her body has never been found. One of two men who were shot and arrested after the killing of the soldier Lee Rigby last week has appeared in court charged with his murder. Michael Adebowale, who's 22, was remanded in custody. The second suspect, Michael Adebolajo, is still in hospital. More than 50 detectives are now involved in the investigation into the disappearance of a 17-year-old girl from Shropshire. A 22-year-old man is still in police custody after being arrested on suspicion of the murder of Georgia Williams. 
The European Commission is taking Spain to court after complaints that British holidaymakers have been charged for emergency treatment despite holding a European health insurance card. All EU citizens have the right to receive state medical care if they carry the card. And figures from the Met Office suggest it's been the coldest spring for more than 50 years. The average temperature over the past three months has been just six Celsius. Sport tonight. French racing authorities have given Frankie Dettori the green light to return to racing. He completed his six-month drug span ten days ago. He'll ride to two races at Epsom tomorrow. Mark Hughes says he'll prove his doubters wrong after taking charge at Stoke City. Rangers have confirmed the appointment of Walter Smith as non-executive chairman. And it's been another bad day for Rory McIlroy after missing the cut at the PGA at Wentworth last week. He cut it a first-round 78-6 over at the Memorial Championship in Ohio. And on Sports Extra right now, we're talking cricket here. They're talking Major League Baseball. The White Sox taking on the Cubs in an all-Chicago matchup, And the Cubs lead the White Sox 7-2, heading into the seventh inning. And just the one thing to mention on the roads in Carnforth in Lancashire. The A601M northbound remains closed at the M6 at Junction 35. There's been a serious accident. Traffic is queuing, so expect long queues there. Faye Rusco, 5 Live Travel. Here's Sandy Bowling to Cook, who drives, and there's his 100. He hits it through extra cover. It hits the rope now. And Alistair Cook is back in the groove. England face New Zealand. The first one-day international. Friday morning from 10.30 on 5 Live Sports Extra. Here's Anderson looking to finish off. Bowls to bowl, edged and caught behind. And England win the series by two matches to nil. New Zealand bowled out for 220. For more info, click bbc.co.uk slash 5 Live. So welcome back to our last half hour of Voices of Summer with us cricket correspondent Jonathan Agnew, TMS summariser Vic Marks and cricket fan and broadcaster Bob Harris. Coming up, we'll play you a number of classic moments from the legendary John Arlott. First, though, a reminder of some of the other great Voices of Summer. He's going for a big one. Is it going to be caught? And it's a magnificent catch. We saw a great catch out there by Brearley. And this is Richards. He's really taking a superlative catch on the fence. The whole West Indian team converging on him. He faces Cumbly again. Pulls this, and that's it. That's four runs. It was a beautiful, inviting delivery for him. Short pitched, and he pulled it away past mid-wicket. And Gooch goes in this historic and magnificent summer for him to another test century. That's Massive Ball again. No wicket for 22, and he's on his way now from the nursery end to boycott. Hold him! Right through him. Here's the Freddies now to Logie. On drives four runs, the match is over. The West Indies have won by eight wickets to take the series 4-0. England striving for this last wicket. They've been doing that for a while. Harmison comes up and bowls and Kasparovic goes back and parries one as he caught down the leg side. There's an appeal for the catch. He's out. England have won. England have won by two runs. Well, you heard there Jim Laker, Don Mosey, Alan McGilvray, Tony Cozier, Jim Maxwell, who you'll hear this summer as well. You can text us on 85058, tweet us at BBC Five Live or using the hashtag Voices of Summer. Chris Pampling says the warm voice of Tony Cozier describing the West Indies soundtrack to many summers. Donna Simmons, what a beautiful voice, says Trevor, commentating on TMS. Her voice, the female version of Michael Holding. Richard Belly, Alan McGilvray, an excellent commentator I remember from Ashes series past. John Malcolm Jones, please mention Don Mosey, the alderman, part of a golden age. Another poster on TMS says Don Mosey brought gravitas and depth, and he did, I guess. He did, and he was a great friend of Brian Johnson's. Again, an unlikely partnership, you'd think. But, yes, Don's a real northern journalist as well and uh, wrote books with Fred Truman. Uh, very descriptive. I only had a season uh, with, with Don Mosey, but very much a, a voice that, that people will remember from the 80s. This one says, why are people far slower to mention Jim Lake 
Baker as a young boy. I remember listening to his TV commentary, found it inspiring and memorable. Charles Cragg in London says, Picture the scene, England need loads to win. Last man, Derek Underwood, striding to the wicket. Jim Lakers, dulcet tones on TV. Cometh the hour, cometh the man. That's all he said. <laughs> Superb. My all-time favourite piece of any sporting commentary. You must have had a soft spot for Jim Laker. <laughs> well, no, I just wish I could bowl like him, really. But, um... <laughs> We're not allowed to have favourites, really, yes, as summarisers. Yes, you can. Well, Tony Cozier. I love working with Tony Cozier because, well, he loves the game and he knows everything about it and he's yes. got the most perfect sort of um, ability to describe everything. I mean, Cozier is coming back, I think, this year he to is. do some Champions yes, Trophy. Yeah. 50 years after he first yeah. stepped over on and, these shores. And Tony's great skill, uh, we talked about television commentary earlier on, nobody goes between one and the other, ball by balling. And Richie doesn't do ball by ball on the radio. He, he was a summariser. Tony does both disciplines on television and radio brilliantly. And that is, I mean, literally going from one microphone to another, do television, radio, television, radio. That That's is a gear shift, isn't seriously it? Seriously skillful. And the other thing he's very good at, if just occasionally he's next door to a summariser he's got fed up with, he can just talk right through him. He just doesn't <laughs> let him. He can talk for ten minutes if he, if he decides to. And you mentioned him right at the beginning, Alan Gibson. Felicity, his daughter, says, always nice to hear my dad mentioned in a favourable way. <laughs> Although I hated cricket as a child, and much of the chagrin of my family, I still don't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, what are those names that you know uh, that we've just heard there? Would you would you pick out? I, I'd also uh, pick Tony Cozier. Yeah. There's a, a fantastic sort of warmth about him, isn't there? There's a sort of quiet storm aspect yeah. to him, as far as I'm concerned. That he's got so much passion, yes. um, but remains so calm, doesn't he? I, I can't remember Tony Cozier being absolutely whipped up by the moment in the way that some he's commentators from, He's from Barbados, man. Yeah, get... and it's, there's a laid-back, but there's a lovely, lovely warmth about yeah, it. Yeah, Alan McGilvery was mentioned, I remember lying yeah. in bed and listening, you know, we talked about that actually TMS inspired us, those yeah. who were working. I remember him commentating centenary test match, Derek Randall's brilliant 100, yeah. Alan McGilvery, just <laughs> the sound of, of Australia coming yeah. through. Mm. And it, it was a tribute, actually, to Jim Maxwell there. That I, I imagine... I, that famous 2005 yep. match, they had wheeled Jim on to do the last few overs because yeah. it looked like Australia were going to win. Yes. Yeah. And then he actually called, which is what they do in Australia, yeah. they call the game, they called an English victory quite yeah. brilliantly, That's really. Brilliant. brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for the remainder of the programme, we're going to talk about John Arlott, who right. commentated on every home test match from 1946 till the end of the 1980 season. He went from Hampshire policeman to cricket commentator after these words of encouragement from that man again, the BBC's Seymour de Lot Bitnier. This old lobby said, uh, I've listened to you, he said, I think you've got a very vulgar voice, matter of fact, he said. Can't understand why people want to listen to it, but... Uh, You've got an interesting mind, he said, and I think you'd better continue. He was pretty good, Lobby, really. He, he was a harsh critic, but his criticisms were invariably right. And, of course, mine was and is a vulgar voice. For many of our young listeners, they won't have heard his distinctive, descriptive commentary before, for many of our younger listeners. So here are two good examples. This is Arlott describing Eddie Barlow's hat-trick for the rest of the world against England at Headingley in 1970. The ball comes back to him, he turns and walks back, his shirt out at the back, broad-backed, strong-looking, stocky, he comes in, bowls to knot and bowls him, and spreads his stumps like twigs. 2-1-9 for seven. They all get down then and in comes Barlow now to Wilson, bowls to him, he goes forward and it pops up and he's caught! He's caught at forward short leg and Barlow is poised in an altogether different melodramatic pose which says, done it at last. And he has got his hat trick. Well, I've only ever seen two test hat tricks in my life. They were both on this same ground and both at about the same time of day. TMS, TMS listener Patrick uh, Jake Jacks has requested hearing the beautiful John Arlott describing Clive Lloyd's batting in the 1975 World Cup final. No difficult, not only to bowl a maiden over, but apparently to bowl a maiden ball. <laughs> Gilmore comes in, bowls, and Lloyd hits him high away on the mid wicket for four. The stroke of a man knocking a thistle top off with a walking stick. 
no trouble at all. And it takes Lloyd to 99. I guess that's a line and a half, isn't it? The stroke of a man knocking a thistle top off with a walking stick. It is it's tricky because because he, he was a canny so and so, John, obviously, <laughs> because I nearly fell out of my chair while reading um, the, the wonderful book on Harold Larwood and the description of George Gunn by one Dudley Carew, and this is the start of the twentieth century. He said of Gunn. He could walk away from a fast bowler and cut him past point with the action of a man decapitating a dandelion with a walking stick. <laughs> John was well read. Yes, yes. Um, and we all do it. We all borrow people's bits. Yeah. But I mean, and obviously he said it beautifully. But Dudley Carew actually wrote that of mm -hmm. George Gunn. Very it's, descriptive. It was better than a kicking horse, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, absolutely fantastic. There's just one other here as well. Alan H. I hope this is not... A, I don't think this is a myth. I just don't, don't know who it's about. In my opinion, the finest style at the master of giving the listener a precise picture and a simple phrase. My favourite, his perfect description of the unique way that Richard Hadley started his run-up, like Groucho Marx pursuing a blonde. Asif Masood. Asif, was it? But he said it, didn't he? But I mean, oh, yes, he definitely said it. We just don't know who the bowler was. It was, was. It was the, Asif, yes. Asif, the Pakistani opening bowler, oh, yeah. Asif, Asif Masood, Masood, who Masood. John has once called Massive Arsud once by mistake. <laughs> uh, he was the one who had that rather strange yeah. Yeah. approach, but that was who he was talking about. Yeah. Fantastic. When you, it's, it's a voice of whatever you want to call it, isn't it? Rich chocolate cake and amongst yeah. many other I mean, I always well. think of him as, as it were, the John Peel of, of cricket commentators. <laughs> yeah. And one of the reasons for that is this wonderful rhythm that his voice had. And it was a way in which also, I think, that he was giving himself just an extra split second mm. to find exactly the right descriptive yeah. words. There's an amazing art to the clear head mm -hmm. that enables you to do that. What strikes me about John Arlott, and again, we never really heard it because we were playing it in Young and Song, but he's actually, he's, he's in tune. If you listen to his voice, it, it's actually like he's almost singing a tune. Mm set against the background noise. It, or or it, it, it is harmonious. That's what's so lovely about listening to John Arlott. I've been speaking to David Raven Allen as well. He was his biographer and was close friends with Arlott for 25 years. And we started talking about Arlott's journey into the commentary box. He went from policeman to a detective sergeant and then started writing to all the literateurs of the time, which prefaced a, um, a career as literary programmes producer in the overseas service in which he was producing a programme called Book of Verse with all the great literateurs of the time, people like Betjeman, Louis McNeese, uh, Cecil Day-Lewis, Dylan Thomas and all that. And I think being seeped in poetry for, what, three years, probably more than that, all added to that, plus the fact, of course, he had that extraordinary voice. It's very difficult today, actually, to sort of realise that just after the war, there were only about, what, Ralph Whiteman, A.G. Street, Wilfred Pickles, just a handful of people speaking with regional accents. And John felt very out of place and once tried to uh, actually change his voice until Valentine Dahl, the man in black, told him he'd tear his tongue out because he said he would be destroying your passport to fame. And there was a suggestion that when he was a policeman and writing poetry that he sent some of it to John Betjeman for his comments. Is there truth to that story? Absolutely, he did. And Betjeman introduced him to Geoffrey Grigson, a West of England producer, who brought him on air as an actor and reading some of his poems. You know, not all of them are on cricket, in fact, very few. And John was a bit uh, averse to that initially because he felt that he didn't want to be known as a freak, a policeman poet. But he soon came round, and, of course, that helped as well. And then from 1946 till the end of the 1980 season, he covered every single home test match. And that is a phenomenally long innings. It certainly is. I mean, I can't... I don't know how many that is, Mark, but it's a, it's a hell of a lot. And, uh, I mean, the, the things that made him different from commentators now was not only the voice, but, I mean, it was the Bon Mo's that he came out with. I mean, you know, remember the old um, Middlesex fast medium bowler, Vincent van der Beyl, and he'd come out with... Vincent van der Beyl, ball pike gleaming in the sun, looking remarkably like Lord Longford, but not nearly so tolerant. He would come out with things like that, you know, off the cuff. Well, I mean, the Clive Lloyd, the famous one, the 1975 World Cup final, the stroke of a man knocking a thistle top off with a walking stick. Yeah. Was, that, was that just instinctive? I mean, he didn't, he didn't plan any of this, presumably, he did it. It really was off the cuff, and because he had such a poetic bent, it came to him so naturally. 
I think I think you're basically right. I think most of them came off the cuff. I think a few might have been prepared, you know, for a situation that's likely to happen. But I mean, I mean, he would say sort of the thing, or what? Um, to- only Toshak's batting, like an old lady poking with her umbrella at a wasp's nest. But some of it might have been semi-prepared, you know, his bat has as many holes in it as a Henry Moore sculpture. But I think a lot of it was spontaneous. When it came to his love of wine, how much of a role did that play in cricket commentary? In other words, you know, did he did he feel that he was sometimes even better after lunch? Can we put it that way, David? <laughs> well, he certainly was sometimes. Um, I mean, a lot of people thought that old battered briefcase contained copies of Wisdom, but of course it was bottles of Beaujolais or Claret. He was often the man who rose to the occasion. If there was something really exciting, he would rise to it. I mean, witness the Freaka commentary, which everybody knows, you know. And then there was a time, of course, in the West Country where he was in the box with a, a, a tyro commentator who was aware that he was sharing a box with the great John Hollett and tried to match up, quite understandably. But every time a batsman made a stroke or a fieldsman made a smart bit of fielding, he would tag it with and the sun is sinking slowly in the west. And in the end, of course, John got a bit exasperated and said, by the way, Bertie Bruce is going back to the river and comes in. And by the way, over his right shoulder, the sun is still sinking slowly in the west. And if by chance it should decide to sink anywhere else, we should be the first to let you know. <laughs> <laughs> what was he like to work with? I mean, what was, he, what, what was his character like, John Arlott? John was a, was a lovely man. I mean, I've never known anybody could be more helpful to people starting or encouragement. He could be lugubrious, or people thought that. He didn't have any time for small talk. Everything he said was to the point, and if he hadn't got anything to say, he wouldn't say anything. So some people thought, well, found that a, a little bit uncomfortable. But for people who knew him, they, they realised, of course, that, that this was just John and... I mean, after his son died, for instance, you know, in that tragic accident on his 21st birthday, John always wore a black tie ever since when there was an occasion to wear a tie. And he never really got got over that, which is understandable. He was a very emotional man, totally emotional. Uh, Just let me just quickly tell you about the Brazil-England match, which is supposed to be taking place on Sunday. It's been suspended for now over concerns about public safety at the refurbished Maracanã. uh, Football's governing body in Brazil has reported to say it's aware of a judge's ruling, but is confident the game will still go ahead. Back to John Oller. Maybe not quite so off the cuff, then, with the old thistle after what you just read out there. But but, but we all prepare things. You're sitting in your car, driving down to a match, and you think of a line. And uh, if you're smart enough, we've got something with you, you can quickly jot it down and, and, and not forget it. So I think that's, yeah, I mean, a, a lot off the cuff, a lot of description, but, yeah, of course, you, you, you do think of things that you're going to say. I think that enhances it anyway, the fact that um, preparation has gone into it, thought yes. has gone into it all, that you've got these thoughts in the back of your mind and you know there'll be a moment in the coverage of the match that afternoon where you can, you can pluck pull it out. The, yeah, and I, I think that's great, yeah. actually. Bob, I'm just thinking John Arnold's probably president of the Deep Voice Club, but you must be vice president, <laughs> aren't you? You're happy, to be in that, you're happy to be in that club, aren't you? I tell you something, though. It's interesting uh, to hear him talk about the producer, as it were, that brought him into... The lobby, yes. Yes, because, um, you know, when I first started on the BBC in 1970, it was pretty strict... Then, you know, and I I had a a hard taskmaster to whom I've always been so grateful for the the knowledge he imparted to me. And that was my first producer, Jeff Griffin. And it was John Peel, actually, that introduced me to him. Now, it was Jeff that instilled into me all the disciplines, the timing, you know, the pace, the, the, you know, everything. Uh, program building, how to construct a show, how to make this link last that bit longer or this one to shorten or whatever it is, you know. And I think the BBC in those days, that was part of the the, the rite of passage, wasn't it? Yes. To get in front of a microphone that you did have somebody or, or a group of people that really taught you the basics of yeah. what, how to do it. And listening to him describing that hat trick... And that was a hat trick. Yeah. I mean, you, you, can, can you imagine describing a hat trick now in, in, in Test cricket? And it's well, there's a hat trick, and I, I take one. I've seen actually, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, there we go. And what's, what's the score? It was amazing, isn't it? Yes. I'm about to describe. We're going to hear him describe one of those famous wickets in Test history. Here he is. Then his commentary says Hugo Freeman on Don Bradman's final innings remains the seminal moment. To be able to respond to the shock with such humanity and empathy captures the essence of both John and the moment. Sydney redhead in Grimsby says he remembers listening. Listening to Bradman's last innings. Here it is then, Oval 1948. Remember, Bradman needs four 
just four to register a test career average of 100. Well, I don't think I'm as deadly as you are, Rex. I don't expect to get a wicket, but it's rather good to be here uh, when Don Bradman comes in to bat his last test. And now here's Hollies to bowl to him from the Vauxhall end. He bowls, Bradman goes back across his wicket and pushes the ball gently in the direction of the, House of, the Houses of Parliament, which are out beyond mid-off. It doesn't go that far, it merely goes to Watkins at silly mid-off. No run, still 117 for one. Two slips, a silly mid-off and a forward short leg close to him as Hollies pitches the ball up slowly and he's bowled. Now just listen there, that John Arnott is saying nothing. He's just allowing the applause at the Oval, the shock almost, just to seep through the airwaves, I guess. He still hasn't spoken. No, nope. it's 30 seconds we timed it. 30 seconds he doesn't speak for, just the applause. It is remarkable, isn't it? I mean, you'd be champing to say yeah. something. Bradman. Incredible. Bold. Hollies. Not. <laughs> what do you say under those circumstances? I wonder if you see a ball very clearly. In your last test in England, the ground where you played out some of the biggest cricket of your life, and where the opposing team have just stood round you and given you three cheers, and the crowd has clapped you all the way to the wicket. I wonder if you really see the ball at all. Wow. That was a that was a Benodian pause, if ever there was one. Wasn't <laughs> I, it? I don't think even Beno <laughs> could go that long. Well, that was amazing. Just to let, because uh, you know, everybody is feeling mm. shock, aren't they? Mm. But the the crowd very respectful and applauding yes. the greatest batsman they've ever seen. And he's, he's I mean, he's you'd have had a producer enough. shouting, yeah, yeah. say something. Yeah. Well, then we've got the line gone down. But he, he <laughs> loved cricketers. He just yeah. loved cricketers, and that comes over. Yeah. But the, the, the modern commentator actually would have been drilled into describing him walking off, which, which, yeah. which yeah. again, and up, up the steps and away, yes. uh, that, which, again, would have been yeah. very... John would have done it absolutely beautifully. What do you think he would have made of 2020? <laughs> well, he did the John Player League, of course, which yeah. Yeah. Was, that was pretty revolutionary in those days. I'll tell you what Johnners would have loved. He'd have loved email and, and Twitter oh. and oh, yes. all of that sort yes. of stuff. I mean, these people, they, they, they would have adapted brilliantly to, to, to the modern game. So we've heard Don Brabham, Neil Carter, Bill Walker and Darren Palmer have got in touch to request this famous clip from England against Australia at Lord's 1975. Oh, is bringing warmer what? Glass of water. <laughs> and a freaker. Oh, a freaker. We've got a freaker down the wicket now, not very shapely, and it's masculine. And I would think it's seen the last of its cricket for the day. <laughs> the, the police are mustered, so are the cameramen and Greg Chappell. And now he's had his load, he's being embraced by a blonde policeman. And this may be his last public appearance, but what a <laughs> splendid one. There was that tinge of disappointment when he said, and it's, it's masculine. masculine. <laughs> but I love the way he said, it's masculine. <laughs> you know, it, it's, ma where it's masculine. Where did freaker from? I asked it? David Raven Allen mm. that. I said, where did the word freaker come from? And, and the, the honest truth is he didn't know. Mm. You know, it's bizarre, because when I heard that, you know, lots of times growing up, I thought I, I thought I must have misheard him and he yes. said it's I don't streaker. think there were many streakers, right? Well, there was no, a, a first phase sure of streakers. Perhaps, of what it was, well, and he yeah. almost got it right, but not, <laughs> not entirely, but uh, <laughs> legendary. Was it Michelangelo? Was he the chap who... Was he the name? I think he was the name of the freaker. Was he? he? Oh, fantastic, I guess, if well, you no, know that. Was. It was a ridiculous yeah. name, I think yeah. it was. Not very shapely and it's masculine. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> wonderful. Jed Sweeney says, I'm not sure if my memory is cheating me, but when Arlott signed off TMS for the last time in 1980, did the listening crowd... Give him an ovation. Well, you know how he signed off, don't you? He said, next, Christopher Martin James. Well, yeah, after a word like from yeah. Trevor Bailey, yeah. it'll be Christopher Martin James. Yeah. And the yeah. crowd did. He used to stop his commentary very early on in the day, about tea time. He wouldn't do any after tea because he was writing for The Guardian. Yeah. Uh, and he never did any in the afternoon session. It was announced, or the final it was session. announced to the PA yes. yeah. at Lord's. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if he thought computed. that through. I bet you he had. Well, that his last him. words would be, you know, yeah. after yes. a word from... Well, him. let's have a listen. Oh, he... The end of a testing over from Lily, full of hostility. Close fielders still grouped round the bat, but safely and capably survived by Boycott and Gar. 72 for two, 28 now, Boycott, 18 Gar. Well, the applause was 
for John Arler, his last commentary. And uh, Trevor, the entire Australian fielders clapping, Jeff Boycott having a clap there, and I'm sure the entire ground clapping at that announcement. A moment indeed of nostalgia and a very nostalgic match. So obviously that's the over after John Arlott's last commentary and you yes. heard the PA very clearly Absolutely. saying John Arlott has yeah. done his last Absolutely. last commentary. David Hoggart said, Aggers is a very modest chap, but he'll be seen as one of the greats when he eventually hangs up the mic. Some time away, I hope. Marcus from Harrogate, Aggers keeps the conversational style going. TMS should be like listening into a group of well-informed mates at the test. Michael Vaughan is a great addition in this respect. I know you can't talk about yourself because you know, because because you're British and you shouldn't do so. But <laughs> and I'm, I'm damned if I'm going to talk <laughs> about him anymore. <anyone. laughs> <laughs> but Michael Michael Vaughan ha does and ha has got it very quickly, hasn't he? Has, he has. Yeah, just just the art of, of again communicating with people you know, everybody who comes onto that program i think all play their part because as we said i think at the very start of all of this it has to be different every contribution every voice every individual every character has to be different if if it all sounded the same it would be a very dull program indeed yeah bob i do this job because of tms my father was a cricket mad and i was playing in the garden with him when i was about 10 and we probably had john arnold on and i said are these people being paid to go to the test match are these people being paid to watch cricket and eat cake and my dad <laughs> loved cricket second only to his family in the world said yes i went well that's not a job is it my exact words that, that's what i'll do honestly you know anybody who's doing what they love for a living is massively fortunate. I really do believe that. I think of myself that, I, you know, how lucky I am. And there are very, very few people in the world with whom I would swap. But yeah. Aggers would be one yeah. of them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, particularly in the West Indies or in Australia yeah. during Come the summer. Come and give it a go. I would absolutely love it. Well, do a swap and I could destroy your, your music <laughs> show. <laughs> Donny Osmond will be on. <laughs> <laughs> I'd really know who Donny Osmond sits with. Dave Farrow, Dave Farrow, who I know very well and is a commentator and has worked here, says, Aggers is right about the streaker. Michelangelo, Dave knows a lot, an Australian merchant seaman from yeah, memory, he says. But it's such a ridiculous name. It's yes. like stuck in the mind. Yeah, it, re it really was. Well, long may it continue uh, in the last half. Thank you for everybody for getting in touch. Tom says, I've been listening since 1985. They feel like family. Thank you to all the commentators. Hamish, I grew up with these voices. Voices of these friends mixed with those of personal chums now gone to take their seats in that far distant pavilion callback as strange echoes from the past. Agus, thank you. Pleasure. Long may Pleasure. Again. Victor, Thanks, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Bob, we will carry on enjoying it as we do. Thank you very much thank for you coming very much, in. Mark. It's been tremendous. Thank you for you. Um, it's on the iPlayer for the next week. It cannot be on the podcast because of the cricket commentary rights etc etc so if you missed it you only caught bits of it you want to listen again you've got a week left to listen on the iPlayer uh, just before we go reminder reports from Brazil in the last 20 minutes England's game in Rio on Sunday suspended at the moment because of stadium safety fears thank you very much for listening more to come with Stephen Nolan after 10 o'clock here on 5 Live